I worked as a flight attendant for a few years when I decided to take an extended sabbatical from college. There were a handful of bad situations that I'd encountered, but one in particular still makes my skin crawl more than any other. I was born and raised in Texas, but had moved to New York when I was 21. So when I found out that the beginning of a week-long trip that I'd have a couple of overnights in Austin, I was super excited to go to my home state for a few days. My brother lived just north of the city, and we planned to hang out and go to dinner the night that I had arrived when he got off work. And the following day, we were going to meet up with our dad who lived about an hour away. So I get to the hotel downtown, the crew and I check in, and then we each head off to our own rooms. A short elevator ride and I get to mine. We're not even five minutes later, there's a loud hard knock on the door. It was only around 1 or 2 p.m. and I hadn't called either my dad or brother to let them know that I was in town yet, so they wouldn't know what room. I assumed it was maybe one of my crewmates, so I headed to the door. Before even making it to the door, however, a loud, no voice on the other side boomed. The front desk sent me about the bathroom problem you called in, before trying to open the door. Unlock the door and open up. Miss, I need in, now. I froze in my tracks. I hadn't even been in the bathroom yet, let alone called anything to the front desk. I'm a petite chick and while I take no crap from anyone despite my size, I still err on the side of caution. Slowly inching toward the door to look out the people, all I could tell was that the man on the other side was at least six feet tall, and easily over double my weight. No way I was going to unlock that door. I responded to the guy, telling him he must have had the wrong room. He continued to pounding on the door while constantly turning the handle, telling me no, he needed in, and he was getting in the room one way or another. I panicked but thankfully had the sense to grab the phone and call the front desk. The concierge confirmed that they had neither sent anyone up to my room, nor had they received a call about the bathroom. The entire time this guy was still determined to get in my room, pounding and yelling. Lucky for me, the front desk had dispatched security to my floor. When these security officers stepped off the elevator a few seconds later, I could hear them in the hall approach and ask the guy who he was and what he was doing, and telling him that he needed to leave the hotel. He immediately gets hostile and aggressive toward them, and the front desk clerk I'm still on the phone with tells me police have been called and that they're on their way. In the meantime, I'm trapped in my room, scared out of my mind. Long story short, the cops show up pretty quickly and manage to arrest the guy for trespassing and criminal menacing or something. I later found out that the guy was also wanting a connection to a string of break-ins in Austin. He had seen and stalked me from the minute that I had entered the hotel lobby. Apparently, I was exactly his type of victim. Nothing else happened after that, but it still rattled the heck out of me for the rest of my stay in that hotel. Two years ago, my husband and I flew to LA for a weekend getaway. We stayed at a boutique hotel off of Sunset. It's more of a hipster type place. Not normally somewhere I would stay, but it was nice, clean, and had a good vibe. We met up with our friends who live in LA and went out for dinner and drinks. It was a late night and we came back to the hotel. I was exhausted and jet lagged. It was around 1.30 in the morning or something like that. My husband is a very deep sleeper. I'm an extremely light sleeper. Except when I've had a bunch of drinks, which I had definitely consumed that night. So, it was lights out for both of us very quickly. Around 3am, I only know the time after everything has happened. I wake up suddenly and open my eyes. There's a light on in our room. The room had been totally dark when we went to bed. The light came from the doorway, which illuminated the silhouette of a man standing at the foot of the bed just standing there, staring. For a moment, I'm speechless, confused and also slightly intoxicated. I haven't yet moved. 
My reaction is delayed and then these stark fear and reality kick in. I gasp and say, what the heck? The man was wearing a red plaid shirt and had dark hair and a beard. I couldn't make out his features as my eyes were adjusted to waking up and the lighting that illuminated him shadowed half of his face. The man says, I need to speak with Drake. I know this may sound somewhat comical, but I assure you at the time it was terrifying. I scream, get the heck out, which jolts my husband awake, who immediately sits up and sees a man at the foot of our bed. My husband is 6'5", which may not be evident given half his body is underneath the bedding, but either way the man responds, oh sorry wrong room, and bolts out slamming the door behind him. My husband jumps up and runs for the door, but I stop him from going outside into the hallway. Who knows if the man is waiting there, trying to lure him out, or whether there are other men out there ready to pounce. I keep looking through the people, but don't see anything. At this point, we are both shot and in disbelief and probably still drunk. We call down to the front desk. No one answers. We call repeatedly and still, no one answers. We contemplate what to do and around 20 minutes later, we decide to get dressed and go down to the front desk. There is an employee at the front desk and there's also a bar in the lobby. My husband walks around to see if he can spot the guy who was in our room. And as he's searching, I go up and start telling the guy behind the front desk what had happened. But as I begin the story, I burst into tears. I realize how shaken up I am. The employee gets the manager and he asks me what time the man came in the room and so on. But I don't know how long he was standing there until I woke up and saw him. I think he must have been there for a long time just waiting for me to wake up. My husband also came back empty handed. We got back up to the room and the next day the manager calls and says that there wasn't anything on the security cameras. I didn't believe him. He offers us one free night to the hotel as compensation, even though he claims he didn't see anything. We take the free night because what else is there to do? We just want to go about the rest of our mini vacation. Why was this man in our room? How did he have a working keycard? But the thought that I have the most trouble with, what would have happened if I hadn't woken up? Our door was locked, but clearly someone had a duplicate keycard. And here's what I've learned. If you don't already, always put the deadlock on your hotel room door. It's something we've never thought to do, and now I always check it. Twice. This happened in the summer of 2010, when I was just entering my teenage years. My family took a trip to a really nice hotel in the city. I can't really remember why we decided to take the trip. But I remember a lot of family friends coming with and staying in adjacent rooms. I've never asked my parents and it's not really important to the story. To preface, I'm a bit of a scaredy cat and always have been. I'm a pretty skinny, fragile kid, so I get spooked pretty easily, even now. This however was almost definitely not me freaking myself out like I normally did. Looking back. I am incredibly lucky I trusted my instincts. This hotel had a strange design to it. The lobby was actually on the fourth floor, not the bottom floor, which I found strange. To access the lobby, you had to use the elevator. There was no way for you to get to it from the stairs. This information would have been nice before everything happened, as you'll find out. The hotel was organized in a square shape. Every floor was lined with a balcony and you could look down into the lobby and cafe area from your floor. Essentially, if you are walking to your room, you could be seen from anyone that was on your floor if they just stepped out of the room and looked around. I was always afraid I would fall over the balcony and sail down 8 stories to my death, but they were high enough to a point where I wasn't concerned for my safety. The first day was nice. My friends and I hung out and played cards all day, or we watched whatever was on TV. At night, we would explore the halls of the hotel and tell each other ghost stories. It was a really fun time, 
even though I didn't fully understand why we were there. On the third day though, things got strange and fast. I woke up to the sound of screaming coming from outside my door. Now, because of the hotel's design I mentioned, sounds from the lobby would echo all the way up to the top of the building. So when I walked outside to investigate, I immediately looked over the balcony to see what the commotion was about. I saw a girl laying on the ground. Eggs and milk splattered everywhere around her. People were rushing to help her and I heard a couple of people telling each other to call 911. It seemed like the girl was unconscious. Maybe she had passed out or something. I scanned the lobby and saw that my family and a couple of my friends were in the lobby getting breakfast, all staring at the event in front of them. I decided that I would rush down to meet them to find out what had happened. The elevator was on the opposite side of my floor, so I took the stairwell located right next to my room. We were on the 7th or 8th floor, so I knew I only had to take about 4 flights down. Not a big deal. I descended for a little while, looking for the number 4 on the wall or the letter L. I passed floor 5, ready to find a door to the lobby. I took about 2 more flights of steps before realizing that there hadn't been a door for the 4th floor, nor had there been a door for the 3rd or 2nd. Now at this point, I probably should have turned back, but I continued down because I was tired and I didn't want to climb back up. There were some weird side hallways that went into pitch black areas with a bunch of piping and wiring, and though I was curious to explore, I passed them by. I quickly hit the bottom floor, a dimly lit and cold room with cinder block walls and concrete flooring. In front of me was a set of double doors. I hesitated at first, but I assumed that this was just another way to get back to the lobby so I opened them and entered. Beyond the doors was a massive warehouse type room, probably the size of a smaller basketball stadium. The only light coming in was from the stairwell behind me, so I wasn't really able to see much. Stairs were stacked and covered in plastic, and tables lined the wall and in the distance, I thought I could see boxes stacked in line against the wall as well. It was probably the storage room of the hotel. I looked around and saw an elevator in the back of the room, so I made my way towards it. I closed the door to the store wall and began to walk in the dim light. The room was super muggy and dusty, and it seemed like nobody had been down there for a long time. As I got closer to the elevator, I noticed it was a little bigger than the elevators in the lobby and other floors. I pressed the up button, but got no response. There was a card swiper next to the button. It must have been for employees only, my thought, and I turned back towards the stairwell doors, making my way past the chairs and tables along the wall. When I got to the door, I gave it a tug. Locked, of course. This is when things started to hit me, and I realized that I was stuck in the dark, dusty basement of a hotel. I didn't have a phone because my parents wouldn't let me get one until I graduated middle school, so I couldn't call anyone. Everyone likely assumed I was still asleep in the room, so I began freaking out believing that nobody was going to look for me. I searched around the warehouse, looking for other ways out. Some areas of the place were better lit than others, so I looked around in areas that I could see first before starting on the darker side of the room. There was one other set of doors that I found, but it happened to be locked as well. I began to cry, scared that nobody would ever find me in this basement. I swear that it felt like hours, but I think only a handful of minutes passed before the door creaked open. It wasn't the door from the stairwell, rather, the second door that I had found. A slim, middle-aged man in a lab coat came out of the doors. Now, if this was a 21-year-old me seeing this, I would be very confused as to why this guy was wearing a lab coat in a hotel. I was only 12 or 13 at the time, so I was immediately relieved at the sight of an adult who looked smart. I approached him, tears in my eyes, and he immediately looked surprised to see me, as you would expect. What are you doing down here? He yelled. 
I got lost on my way down to the lobby and I've been lodging here. Do you have a key? Mai was shaking, eager to get out of there. Me didn't answer my key question and instead he said, I know a way out of here, follow me. He began to walk towards the doors of the stairwell and I followed, relieved that someone had finally come to save me. We approached the doors and I began to reach for the handle, but he continued walking. Isn't it right here? I asked him. I'll never forget the look in his face when I said that. He looked nervous and though it was dim, I could see sweat glistening from his forehead and behind his glasses. No, this way, he said sternly. I continued to follow him, but I was now nervous myself. We had passed the door to the stairs and we were now headed towards a darker side of the basement away from the elevators. He looked like he had no clue where he was leading me, as he kept checking around him, almost as if he was taken in his surroundings for the first time. We turned a corner and began walking towards the boxes, a dead end. I immediately froze, realizing that something was very, very wrong. This guy had no idea where he was going, nor did he appear to work at the hotel. I said, my voice shaking. Okay, where are we going? He turned and said, This way, just follow me. I knew that there were no doors by those boxes. I had checked there first after I had found out the stairwell door was locked. I wanted to thank whatever god is out there for gifting me with the idea that I had next. I started yelling as loud as I could. I yelled so loud that I gave myself a headache. The man, irritated and plugging his ears, began yelling back at me. What are you doing? Be quiet. I continued to yell. I don't even remember how long I was yelling. Finally, the man snapped and began quickly walking towards me. I went in a full sprint towards the stairwell doors, hoping to God they would somehow be magically open. He didn't run after me. He walked sternly behind me, muttering things like stupid and other kind of compliments. I was about five feet from the door when somebody burst through, my savior, a hotel janitor who had heard the screaming from the stairwell. He saw the situation. Me and some random guy in a lab coat at a locked basement and immediately told me to get behind him. The janitor asked me who the man was and I said I had no idea, that he had come in through the door on the other side of the room and I pointed to the door. The janitor quickly radioed into the desk that he had found a child in the basement and quietly so that I wouldn't hear. He said, this man came from outside and get security or something like that. The man in the lab coat started trying to argue with the janitor claiming that he was simply looking for a bathroom. The janitor clearly wasn't buying it, and he kept saying things like, wait till security gets here and talk to them about it. I was standing beside him the whole time, trying to take in what was happening, confused out of my mind. Eventually, an employee from the front desk arrived and took me back to the steps of the lobby, where I met with my family who surprisingly had no idea I was missing. I told them the story, crying and shaking, and they hugged me tightly, thanking the employee over and over again for their help. I never got to thank that janitor though. Looking back now, I have absolutely no clue what that band was doing in the basement. I don't have any information as to what happens afterwards or who he was. I know for a fact that the incident with the girl in the lobby was unrelated. Something about low blood sugar. Not sure. I thought about that day a lot and the only explanation I can put together is that the door that I had found in the basement lead to the streets of the city where he had must have wandered from. I have no clue what his intentions were, why he was wearing the lab coat or why he chose to pretend to know a way out. To be frank, this could have just been a huge misunderstanding of some sort and I just chose a really bad time to get lost. But all I know for sure is that if I hadn't screamed my lungs out, I might not have been telling this story the same way, or at all. So, a strange man in a lab coat wandering around a dark, dusty hotel basement. Let's not meet.
So, I live in supported housing. This means that I basically have a room in a house that I share with others who have learning disabilities. When my best friend moved in, this one particular tenant, who we soon started calling Creeper, full on stalker, he would lurk outside our room late at night, waiting for her to come out. If she didn't come out, he would go outside and knock on her window. He would watch her come out of the shared bathroom from the top of the stairs. He tried to kiss her, and one time touched her on the shoulder and said he was looking after her. When a support worker asked what he was doing, he also waited on the stairs when her and I came back from a trip at like half past 11 at night. Needless to say, we waited around the side of the building until he went away. He also watched her through his blinds, and he's been warned at least three times by support workers to leave her alone. Now here's the worst part. He's 45 and she's 22. And he has a girlfriend who he's been with for 10 years, but he doesn't like her very much, judging by the frustrated phone calls he has with her on the daily. Now, he also displayed a milder form of this behavior when I moved in, but he started leaving me alone within a few months. But the difference with my friend is that he is infatuated with her. Not only is he emotionally and physically trying to cheat on his girlfriend, who he doesn't even seem to like, but he's been doing it since my friend moved in, which was at the beginning of the year. He needs to be charged with something, and his girlfriend needs to dump him. He needs to be thrown out of the house too. But people keep giving him an excuses not to have him punished, and I'm sick of it. If it weren't for whatever he has, he'd be in prison. I wanted to share this because I'm done with him. I want him to leave my friend alone. I want him out of the house. The staff aren't doing anything about it. So I'm going to take matters into my own hands. But what should I do? So, this is my second time writing in the sub. I'm a female in my early 20s and I filed a police report and I've already told the story to those close to me. But I feel like venting about my piece of crap ex-housemate to you guys. And then it would make me feel a little bit better. Kareem is somewhat close to his name, so I'll use that. Now, I'm not very good at reading people, unlike my landlord. When I first met Kareem, he seemed polite enough. He was super tidy, filled the house with amazing smelling cooking, and best of all, he stayed out of my way. I'm kind of a loner and stayed holed up in my room with the company of my gerbils to quietly study and play Minecraft. We didn't cross paths often when the school year had started in September. He was the replacement for my housemate. It's a three bedroom apartment and I had been living with another girl, Nellie, for a year already. She was pretty absent from the house and as she was almost always at her boyfriend's place, and the third housemate had moved out. Early on, he was honest of his past that I should have taken as a warning but took him as being earnest. I had asked him during the mini interviewing process that Nelly and I were holding for potential tenants if he was 420 friendly. He was, but as it turned out he was a little too friendly. A couple years ago he had been arrested for illegal possession of weed and sent back to his home country of Turkey for a year before being allowed back into Canada to continue his studies. Now, I didn't know how this kind of stuff works to be honest, but that's what he told us. Now, I try not to be a judgmental person, since he made it seem like it was a thing of the past. Now, I learned this was not the case. One of the first things I noticed in September was that he smoked almost constantly. And not to the point of missing classes, but the whole house would stink up multiple times a week in the evening. Normally, I wouldn't mind a little smoke, but any stoner will tell you that each strain is different, and for whatever reason, his weed had caused really severe panic attacks for me. 
Around late October, I got sick of his stuff and told him to figure out how to contain it to his room. And he said that his joints are hard to contain, and that he really needed a bong. So I let him borrow mine. About two weeks later, in November, Kareem said that he had broken the down stem, but that he would replace it. Within a few days, he did replace it, but it was the wrong size. Maybe it was a bit picky of me, but I told him to buy the right size, and he refused. Said that it was too expensive. I mean, I don't know what's my property, and he broke it. He should fix it appropriately, right? Let me know if that request was out of line. What I know was not out of line, however, was what I did after what happened in mid-February. Around January, my landlord said we should start looking for new housemates, which was reasonable enough. Not to Kareem, though. My landlord had always been slower responding to messages due to the nature of her job, but he absolutely hated her guts for it. He called her awful things and every name under the sun behind her back, which made me feel weird considering I had been her tenant for three years now and we were on good terms. Before I move on to the next part, I would like to quickly add that at one point during the housemate hunting process, he asked me if I would be willing to move out so that his friends could move in, and that it would be super amazing if I did. Obviously I said no. My landlord later confirmed that he had asked her if he could sign the lease behind my back. As I mentioned earlier, we had forged a good rapport over the last three years so it was a firm no. Kareem had got excessively antagonistic about my landlord's deadline when she wanted us to sign the lease. Started at looking at the law, saying he legally didn't need to give her notice until X date, which wasn't true. He told me to quietly look for housemates and tell the landlord at the last possible date, which made me super uncomfortable since it was around midterms, and was secretly grateful she was pushing for the deadline so strongly. I just wanted it over with. It was shortly before I signed the lease with my new housemates that he showed how truly two-faced he was. I dug through our Facebook messages. The gist of the conversation was this. Kareem, can I use your laundry after I move out? I don't have laundry on site. Sorry, no, that's kind of weird. No, it's not. We'll pay you. We... Yeah, me and my housemates. Note, I never met these housemates before and still have no idea who they are. At this point, I started getting extremely weirded out. I said no a few times, but caved and started saying stuff like, I'll think about it, to appease him. Though I had zero intent of letting him use my stuff. It seemed like the best way to get him off my back since for almost a week he had continuously pressured me and to try to get me to say yes. Things hit the first of two crescendos when, the day before, me and the two new tenants I chose, super awesome dudes by the way, were supposed to sign the new lease. Back to Facebook and again, an approximation of our conversation. If you don't promise to let me use your laundry next year, I'm going to make a scene in front of your housemates. A scene. When they come sign the lease with her, I'm going to tell them how awful our landlord is, that she doesn't care about us and is terrible at replying to our messages. If you let me use your laundry, I'll wait until they leave to tell her to her face. In other words, he was going to make my new housemates question my judgment and make them think that I was a bad person or something. Why else would he go off in front of them and my landlord and tell me she was a horrible and nasty person? He later claimed that these messages were a joke to which I messaged back asking where the punchline was because I didn't see it. I felt like a badass saying that, not gonna lie. Especially since he never got around to explaining this supposed joke. At this point, I had a bit of a breakdown. I called my landlord that night when Kareem had left the house for a few hours, letting her know exactly what had happened and what he was planning to do the next day even sending our screenshots of our Facebook messages and telling her that I couldn't let her and my new housemates come over in good conscience. 
Call me a snitch, I don't care. This guy does martial arts three times a week and despite being shorter than me, could definitely send me through drywall if he felt like it. I felt threatened and didn't want to know what he would do if he found out that I told her, and was the reason signing the lease was rescheduled to a different time and location. She believed me, especially when she read all the text messages. Full context, nothing conveniently cropped. She even saw the parts where I was playing along and calling her names too. That's when she told me that she had seen straight through his act while he was signing the lease. Apparently, he spent half an hour reading and rereading our lease, which is abnormal, asking weird questions and being rude to her. After years of being a landlord, she could clearly see that he's the type of overly macho guy that likes to control women, but gave me the benefit of the doubt. I'm inclined to agree, especially looking in hindsight at how he's treated the woman, me, the landlord, and Nelly, versus men, Nelly's boyfriend and my male friends, in our lives. So, I signed the lease with my new housemates the next day at a coffee shop, telling Kareem that it was out of the blue that we were signing elsewhere, and that I had no idea why we had changed plans, and I thought that I had gotten away with telling on him. Until my landlord sent him a letter from her lawyer that we had very clearly stated that he would not be allowed to demand the use of the laundry again, and that if he came back to the house after moving out, it would be considered trespassing. At first, I thought it was an overreaction on her part, but looking back on those messages, I can see why she made that decision. He angrily knocked on my door and shoved the letter in my hands when he got in that day aggressively and quite frankly melodramatically saying you betrayed me i kid you not those were his exact words i think he lost his grip of me since he could no longer pressure me now that the secret was out which frustrated him things then settled down temporarily he would retaliate in small ways going out of his way not to sort the recycling in proper bins not cleaning out the shower drain, putting plastic and metal in the compost bin, and smoking weed excessively. They were small, but they irritated me. It was the day after he moved out that we reached our second and final crescendo, which led to the police report from the initial paragraph. After months of stuffing his shirt under the crack of my door to keep the weed stink out, and generally being freaked out to the point of carrying a small kitchen knife in my pocket whenever I left my room after the laundry incident. You can bet your butt I was counting down those last days gleefully. He said that he left a few things behind from the kitchen. He came along with a friend and we sorted out whose Tupperware was whose. On his way out, he spotted my mop and bucket. He claimed that it was his and that he wanted it back. I had had this mop and bucket for two years. Why the heck was he claiming that it was his? I said no and he started roaming around the house, saying that he wanted his mop and bucket, and that if this was mine, his must be elsewhere, which made me uncomfortable as hell. I diffused the situation by saying I wanted to use it, and I would give it back later. I was planning on keeping it. I am under zero obligation to let him back in. Remember the letter that said him coming back in the house after he moves out is trespassing, and he instantly snapped out of it. Later that day, he even said that I could keep it. Why he changed his mind is beyond me. The next day, Kareem said he had left two more items behind. I was irritated at this point. I just wanted to be left alone. I said I would leave it outside. I admit, I definitely shouldn't have done what I did next. I was annoyed and I cringe when I read my own messages, but his reaction was completely out of proportion. Kareem said, Yeah, I'll stop by in a few hours. I just got out of the shower. I'm busy, can't you come by now? Just throw on some shoes and shorts and a t-shirt, nobody's outside. By the way, at this point, my town had been on lockdown for two months. Since it's a university town and I live in an area almost exclusively populated by students, 
Nearly everyone was gone and it had been a ghost town for weeks. I should also note that he had not been taking good social distancing measures whenever he was over. And had zero problem getting him close even though he had recently been to a much bigger city with a bad outbreak. Just thought that I would point that out. Fine, then give me my mop and bucket. You said that I could have it. Give it back. No. I put the two items, a train and a mug on the porch. A few minutes later I heard a polite knock. I knew it was him and I ignored it. A few seconds later, a ring on the doorbell. Another ring, a louder knock. He kept ringing the doorbell over and over. Exasperated, I opened it and he stood there smiling. Give me my mop and bucket. No. I quickly shut the door. Truth be told, I was worried he would try to stick his foot in the door and try to stop me from closing it, but he didn't move. He started knocking again and ringing the doorbell repeatedly. At first, it was with some time in between, a few seconds, but it grew in frequency and volume. It went from firm knocking to louder, angry knocking. It felt like I was running a marathon, my heart was beating so fast, since he started up straight up pounding on the door so hard that I could see it move, literally screaming, GIVE ME MY STUFF, over and over at the top of his lungs. After about two or three minutes of him being aggressive in doing this, I can assure you it felt like hours. He stopped and I heard this weird metallic scraping sound, like metal on concrete, accompanied by a grunt, followed by a loud metallic clang, and then silence. I waited for a while. I stealthily looked through the windows and didn't see him. I opened the door and to my surprise, Saw that he had pulled my mailbox off the wall and thrown it onto the path leading to the sidewalk. I kicked myself for not filming the incident, but took my sweet time taking the perfect picture to show that he had made some kind of attempt to destroy the property. I mean, not much that I can do. It felt like the right thing to do, nonetheless, and I still have it. I ended up putting the mop and bucket outside and telling Kareem to come get it and I, I just wanted to leave me alone. I even took out the battery of our door code since a part of me is paranoid it will try to guess it and break in. He came by and took it and I watched him leave from the window. He hasn't contacted me since. I saw him on the street the other day and he gave me a warm smile as if we were friends, but I looked away and crossed to the other side to avoid him. I filed a police report of the incident the same day, as advised by my landlord. She told me during our phone call that he had a documented history of aggression, and I'm not shocked. I'm surprised she gave me the benefit of the doubt though, and let him sign the lease in the first place. I guess this was a learning experience for us all. When I asked her of her honest opinion of my new housemates, she said they were trustworthy. Plus, it turns out that the guys and I have a mutual buddy, so I'm not scared of them. I told them about the whole incident and they blocked him on Facebook. They were super supportive and I'm glad that I filed a report. They know who he is and they won't let him inside. The thing that freaks me out a little is that he moved down the street. I can see his new unit from my window. I can't really say, let's not meet again, since we live so close, and we'll inevitably cross paths on the street in the future. But I can confidently and without hesitation say, Kareem, get aft. In 2011, I was apartment hunting and found this one place that seemed perfect. There is a main house, behind it was a guest house that had been recently renovated into a duplex. The ground floor of the guest house had been converted into a large covered garage that could fit, three cars plus a ton of storage items. It was really musty, had a terrifying spider population, and lacked working lights. 
A flight of wobbly wooden steps led up to the second floor deck, where two side-by-side -side entrance doors for the separate apartments were. When I first moved in, the guest house had just finished renovations, and the rental agency hadn't found anyone for the other apartments yet. I enjoyed the peace and quiet, which was perfect for studying. A few months after school started in the fall, a new girl moved in. She introduced herself as Angela, and said that she went to the same school as me. She was studying biology and was a freshman. She seemed pretty nice and was pretty quiet at first. However, of course, cue nightmare. After the first month, I started hearing an annoying clapping noise emanating from her apartment. It sounded like she had cloven hooves. She had wood floors and the sound echoed like crazy. It would suddenly start at 3am, and it would wake my dogs and they would start howling. Soon, I started hearing the most comical sex noises ever. It sounded like the cheesiest ones you could expect. This went on every day, multiple times a day. At first I thought, good for her. After the third day though, I was tired of it. Bye bye perfect study environment. One day when I was getting ready to step outside to grab the mail, I heard voices out on the deck talking. One male, one Angela. I peeked out through my people and saw an older guy, maybe 60 to 65 years old, with a fat belly, white hair, and a sweat-stained undershirt. This was maybe 10 minutes following one of the comical sex routines. I assumed that she had a super old sugar daddy and waited until they left to grab my mail. A week later, I pulled into the back alley that led to the garage entrance and saw a car parked in front of the garage blocking the entrance. I assumed Angela had a friend over who decided to park there. So, I knocked on her door and she answered in feathered lingerie and clear platform stripper shoes. A very sweaty and out of breath older guy said that he would move the car. By this point, I hadn't realized what Angela was really doing. I excitedly texted my friends the news and we laughed about it. The next night, it was really dark out. I had gone to the grocery store and pulled into the back alley. The floodlight was out and it was unnervingly dark. I always hated pulling into the garage because it's insanely creepy, especially when it's this dark out. However, I opened up the door, slid my car in, and then got out to unload. A dark shadow stood at the garage entrance next to my trunk. Hello. I almost peed my pants. Though I liked my guest house, it wasn't in the best neighborhood, and I was convinced that I was going to be mugged finally. Instead, the man made small talk, asking me if I lived next door to Angela, was I a student, how did I like the area, and did I have a boyfriend, and so on. He told me that I was very beautiful and that he had always wanted an Asian girlfriend. I walked closer to him and saw it was the man from the other week with the white hair and the sweat-stained shirt. I was really evasive and asked him if he needed any help. When he said that he just wanted to get to know me, I said, no thanks. He told me that he would pay me. I realized he probably thought that I was the same as Angela, and I quickly told him to get out of here. I rushed past him and I went upstairs, leaving my groceries in the car and the garage door wide open. Shortly after, I started noticing that things were missing or moved in my apartment. Clothes would go missing. I would hunt desperately for a pair of leggings or a dress or a bra, and I would never be able to find them, even after searching the laundry hamper. Stuff like mail or books would be moved from one room to another. My dogs and cats also started acting really skittish. Sometimes, I would catch them staring intently up at a corner. One night, I woke up at around 3am to hear really serious scratching noises coming from the living room. It sounded like a large animal with big claws was digging away at something. I mumbled, Muffin, stop. I felt a paw on my arm and I slowly opened my eyes. Muffin was on my bed with me, looking at me nervously. Okay. I sat up and looked around. My other dog and my cat were both sleeping soundly on my bed too. So what was in the living room making these scratchy noises? 
I also noticed that my bedroom door, which I had shut when I had gone to sleep, was now wide open. Nope. I've never been one to believe in the supernatural, but I was pretty convinced based on the signs that there was a ghost living in my apartment. I put in headphones to drown out the noise and stayed up all night doing paranormal research on my laptop. I never once got out of my bed to check the living room. I was way too terrified. The next day, I created my dogs and cats and I went to school. When I got home, I noticed the wall next to the front door had some really deep scratches in it. The drywall and paint were ruined. These hadn't been there the previous day and my pets were crated while I was gone. So I couldn't figure out where these had come from. Must be the ghost, I thought. The landlord had told me previously that there were paint cans in the garage. So I figured I would try to hide the ghost mess with some paint. I went down into the garage. Right in front of my parking spot inside the garage is this weird little workspace that someone had constructed before I moved in. I never looked inside, but it was maybe a 6x4 and had walls made of particle board. I didn't see any cans of paint on the garage floor, so I figured this was a storage room for stuff like that. I opened the makeshift door to the workspace. First, I saw shelves with paint cans. Great. And then I looked down and saw a blanket, pillows, a flashlight, a giant plastic canister of cheese balls, a big screwdriver, and a Velcro wallet. There was also a weird set of pull down stairs at the top of the workspace, attached to the garage ceiling, like the kind you would use with an attic. I picked up the wallet and looked inside. Bam, a photo idea of that creepy sweat stained shirt guy. I immediately fled the garage and went into my apartment to call the cops and report that a homeless guy had apparently moved into my garage. The cops came to investigate. First they found that the pull down stairs led to a door in the ceiling that resembled a ceiling tile. When they lifted and moved the ceiling tile aside, you were in my unused utility closet in my apartment. The cops asked if I ever noticed anything strange in my apartment, and I told them about the missing and moved stuff. Apparently, the screwdriver found in the workspace had flecks of paint and drywall on it. I don't know why someone would just sit in my living room and scratch at the wall with a screwdriver in the middle of the night, but I am so glad that I never left my bedroom to look at the ghost now. The cops never found my missing clothing though. The cops also never found or caught the guy. I tried to confront Angela about the weirdos that she was bringing to our building and how one had been living in the garage and breaking into my apartment, but she mysteriously disappeared. No more funny noises at 3am or clopping. Mail piled up in her box and then randomly, a month later, a new guy was living there. Weirded out, I called the landlord, who said the new guy was a new tenant and wouldn't give me information on what had happened to Angela. Creepy. When I was a kid around 8 or 9 years old, my uncle would take me and my two younger cousins, all girls, to a park every Thursday evening. It was a small rundown park but had bright lights and a few functional rides like spinning teacups and a small train so we enjoyed our weekly trips there. Being the oldest, I was kind of an old soul, overly cautious, reserved and somewhat paranoid. I would tell my younger cousins to behave well in public, not to make too much noise or to be overly friendly with strangers. However, I was still a child and often went with the flow. During one of our weekly outings, we decided to visit the haunted shack on the park, which was another amusement presented by the low budget park. As we were going in, a group of young men also slipped in. When the park attendant told them that they only allowed family members to accompany minors, they claimed that they came with us and they were our uncles. Numbly, and like the idiot that I was, I nodded when the attendant asked me. I was just relieved that I wouldn't have to be alone with my younger cousins in the haunted house. The house was more of a mud hut, with hay on the floor and a very strong smell of decay. There were strobing red string lights around and some random broken pieces of furniture. The show began 30 seconds after we went in, with two ghosts coming in and flapping their arms at us. 
and the ghosts were much dressed like the scarecrow from The Dark Knight, and the odor coming off their costumes made me gag. By then, all three of us cousins were backed up against the wall, with the other two huddling behind me and the ghost flapping their dirty sleeves in my face. I screamed at that point, not because of my fear of the paranormal, but because it being a small dark shack bathed in red light, surrounded by strange men, set off my paranoia. The young men, probably in their early to mid-twenties, jumped in front of us in a very dramatic gesture with their arms outstretched, and put us girls behind them. My cousins, aged five and seven, started crying, and held onto both of my hands and legs of their uncles. It would have not been a creepy gesture, but the men kind of started pushing us against the wall with their bodies, hands still outstretched, and patting us on the face and body. I still remember how sweaty his hand was as it moved over my skin, and how his body pressed against mine in that congested, dark, stinky space. Hysterical, I yanked at my younger cousins and screamed that I needed to leave right then. One of the young men said something about not leaving until the ride was over, but I wasn't listening. I screamed and I hit them. I was a very charming child with an exceptionally loud set of lungs, and demanded that they open the door. Once outside, I almost fell on the grass, oddly drained but thankful to be out of whatever that was. One of the young men came up and touched my hair and murmured, Sweet baby, and walked away. I dragged both of my cousins and ran until we found our actual uncle. The group of men just watched us go with the creepiest smiles. Also, fun fact, but there is a large hole in the boundary wall of the park, and next to it was a strip of unkempt trees, which to this day is infamous for its population of druggies. We never returned to that park again and didn't speak of the entire episode. I'm 23 now and reading other stories in this thread just triggered that one long suppressed memory. So, dear ghosts and uncles, let's not meet again. This happened about 12 years ago. I was 16 at the time. It was summer and I was hanging out with my friend Leanne and a guy that I liked, Billy. We were sitting around trying to figure out something fun to do when Billy said, Let's go to a haunted house. Leanne and I were goth girls at the time and got really excited by his suggestion. I don't really know what we thought we would do. Maybe sit around in a dark house and talk to ghosts. But we drove on over to the haunted house. The house sat all alone in a giant field of overgrown grass. I don't remember what time it was, but it was dark and there weren't any streetlights near the house and all the windows were boarded up. We marched through the grass and I, wanting to seem cool, marched to the front door first. Again, wanting to appear cool in front of my crush, I decided to be the one to open the door and go in first. I reached out. The door was unlocked and I pushed it open. It was pitch black inside. I couldn't see into the house at all. It was like a blanket of blackness that was in front of me. I then got an eerie feeling. The kind of feeling you get when someone is watching you. I felt like someone was standing in front of me in the blackness. And that's when I heard it, just a few feet in front of me. The quiet and steady sound of someone breathing. I lost it. I started screaming and turned around and ran away. Lan and Billy started laughing and followed me nonchalantly. I ran all the way back to the car where they both started making fun of me. What was that? Leanne asked. Breathing, I heard breathing. Someone was breathing. You probably heard one of us, said Billy. No, it was right in front of me. Someone was breathing. They continued to make fun of me, telling me it was my imagination, but I was adamant. They tried to convince me to go inside with them, but I refused. I was not going back in there. I was creeped out and I had a very bad feeling. I was not going to go in that house. About 20 minutes after they gave up and we all decided on a new plan for the night. A few days later, Leanne approached me. So I told my mom about that house we went to the other night. She says that house is a well-known squatter house where homeless people, drug addicts, and crazies hang out. I'm so glad we didn't go inside. 
To this day, I know for a fact someone was standing in front of me. I don't know what would have happened if we had gone inside, but I'm so happy we didn't. I used to lead an outdoors club, and one of the trips I would always take people on was to the Smoky Mountains in mid-October. The Smokies are beautiful, and we would do a four-night backpacking loop using the backcountry, three-walled shelters along the Appalachian Trail. The weather was perfect. Fall colors, a cool night, and the classic fog that gives the Smokies their name. It was our last night on the trail, and we were staying on top of Mount Lacante one of the tallest mountains in the Smokies. I had reserved all the spots in the shelter, about 12, and there were no other campsites on the top of the mountain, so I knew that we would be alone. Here's some background to bear with me. The top of Mount Lacante has a western lookout point, an eastern lookout point, and a half mile trail called the Boulevard that connects the overlooks and runs the ridgeline of the mountain. The trail is covered by scraggly evergreens that cling to the top of the mountain and there are a thousand foot drops along the trail edge. The shelter is about midpoint on that trail. All my friends and I decided we would sleep under the stars next to the shelter because the Milky Way was incredible. And then at 5am, we were all going to walk with our sleeping bags to the eastern lookout point to see the sunrise. But we stayed up late and my friend and I decided that he and I would just go to the eastern lookout at 3am and chat until the sun began to rise. It was a chilly night, about 27 degrees Fahrenheit, and the fog had rolled in. It pushed through the dense evergreens and limited our visibility to the bright white cones from our headlamps. My friend and I grabbed our bear spray and sleeping bags, and started walking eastward on the boulevard. Once we started moving, I realized how bad the visibility was. The trail snaked through the foggy trees and you could never see what was around the next bend. There were reports of bears in the area, so I kept my bear spray out and made as much noise as I could. The fog rolled through the trees like a haunted house. As I turned to bend, I nearly run into a man. He's standing alone in the middle of the trail facing me. Not moving, no flashlight. At 3am in the wilderness, just standing in the darkness. I also realize that he's wearing a t-shirt and he only has a small book bag. Keep in mind it's about freezing. With bear spray leveled, I stammer, uh, Hello. No response. I ask him where he's coming from and where he's going. I don't know. His facial expression looks lifeless. I ask him where he's planning on sleeping tonight, given that he has no gear. I don't know, with you. Heck no. I could put it together pretty quickly, this guy was definitely on a lot of drugs. He eventually admitted that he had walked from town that is about 30 miles away. But he kept on saying that he wanted to stay with us at the shelter, and then he would speak nonsense. Suddenly said, I'm being followed by a dog. I figured he was just seeing things, so I asked him what it looked like. It's big and black and it has an orange collar. Crap. I realize that's probably one of the tagged bears in the park. This sketchy guy is being stalked by a bear and leading it towards my friends who are sleeping in a shelter. I tell him I know of a spot that he can stay. A luxury cabin compound about 15 minutes down the mountain where they can call the MPS. I tell him to walk in front of me and I start directing him on where to turn. I figured if he tried something erratic, I could blind him with my light and follow up with the bear spray. I eventually get him down to this cabin and wake the employees to let him know that he needs help. They tell me that I can leave, so I head back to my friends and tell them what's going on. Before I go to sleep, I jog back down to the rangers to make sure that everything is fine. We don't know where he went. He stepped out of the door and now we can't find him. Creepy man in the fog, let's not meet again. I was 14 years old when I had to live with my grandparents. I had to live with them because my sister was in college and my parents were divorced. They lived in this old bungalow type house. It was one story and we had have stairs that immediately goes up to the attic. An attic which no one really uses, we just put stuff up there. It's really just too hot and stuffy up there. 
The cell window there didn't really help. The attic had old creaky wooden floors that I used to have to polish with a coconut shell. Because that's how we do it here in the Philippines. That and my grandparents are very traditional. Anyways, my door room was near these stairs leading up to the attic. Like, you open my door and then face right and the stairs would be immediately right there. I hated that every time I left my room because I would expect that something would be immediately crawling down from the attic. One night, my grandparents had to pick up my aunt's family from the airport. But because of the horrible traffic here, they had to leave at 7pm. And their expected arrival back home would be at the most 5am. So a 14 year old girl would be alone at home the whole time. I told them that I would be safe here. We lived in a gated community. We had tons of guard dogs. Everything would be okay. Or so I thought. Before they left, we already had dinner so I was stuck with cleaning the dishes and all. As I was doing that, I could hear a bunch of neighboring dogs barking a lot. I didn't really think much of it, because the dogs always do that. When I finished cleaning up from dinner, I immediately went and locked every door and window, and I turned off the lights before heading to bed. When I entered my room, the lights were open and they looked normal. My anime posters were on the wall, my closet was untouched. My bed was next to my barred, tinted windows. We had to tint them because I was on the first floor and my grandparents wanted to make sure that nobody would peek into my room. They were barred too because my uncle, who used to use the room, always escaped through there to go to parties. And this was my grandparents' solution to that. Nothing was out of place to alarm me. Everything was normal. Until I turned off the lights. As soon as I did that, a silhouette of a man was illuminated by the streetlights outside. He looked like he had thick curly hair and a skinny build. I thought I was having hallucinations. And so I turned the lights on again and he was gone. I turned him off again and he was back. Turned on, gone. Turned off, gone. I sighed in relief. I was just tricking myself I guess or something else was cast in the shadow. I double locked my door just to be safe. One with the doorknob lock and one of those door latches type locks, and then I tucked myself in. It was hard to fall asleep when a lot of the dogs were barking outside. They weren't our dogs, but our neighbors. But I was finally falling asleep when I heard something from above me moving, something in the attic. I pushed down the thought, I'm tricking myself again. I hugged my pillow. It's just rats, I said to myself. These rats seemed heavy and were also pushing furniture around. My heart sank when I heard them hurriedly go down the stairs and stop at the bottom. I covered myself in my blanket and I waited for something. I was also wishing that my parents had given me a phone at the time like this, but I only waited in bated breath. Suddenly, I heard my doorknob being gently fiddled. I wanted to vomit when I heard a click, followed by a quiet turn of the knob. The knob turned, but it didn't budge. When they noticed, they tried to push it. This time, I had finally stood up. Shaking, I was a kid home alone with no phone, no means of defense. All was that was saving me was this thick door from the old days. I softly pushed my body up against the door and locked everything up again. I didn't want to make a sound. I didn't want to scream. I didn't want him to know where I was. I don't know why he stopped, but he did. I didn't go back to bed. I just sat there at the door waiting. It felt like forever. I heard footsteps go up the stairs, but I still sat there. I saw something move in the corner of my eye, there out of the window. The shadow was back. I forced myself not to look. All I could think of was, thank god that they were barred. I don't remember what happened next. I think I fell asleep or I was too scared to even think straight. I just remember the next day when my family and I were finally having breakfast. 
I casually brought it up to them. Uh, grandfather, I think I heard footsteps up in the attic last night. My grandmother scoffed. It's probably rats. I never brought it up again. I didn't want them to worry. I probably was. But I do know this. Our dogs were caged up near the gate and were far away from my room, so they wouldn't have seen anything. The only dogs who were near my room were the neighbors. Also, there was nothing outside my window that could cast a shadow that looked like a man. And lastly, the attic window was open. I really don't think that it was rats. I still feel sick to my stomach, and I am honestly so freaked out right now. I have every light on in the house. Anyways, here it goes. I volunteered for a 24-7 wildlife rescue service here in Australia that mostly amounts to picking up orphaned joeys from the side of the road, catching sick wallabies and roos, getting possums out of fireplaces, and others ranging from very challenging to the basic. Now, I don't drive so I only do rescues in my area or relatively nearby suburbs. I live a block away from a wildlife reserve that has a problem with toxoplasmosis, a parasite that is basically deadly to most macropods, animals with pouches and marsupials. So when there was a call out at 9pm in the reserve right next to me for a medium sized wallaby with toxo, I had been bored all day on my day off and went, heck why not. I got my rescue tub which contained my essentials a hessinge bag, ties, gloves, and head torch, and I went on my way. The couple that called in the room were at the entrance of the trail, and they told me where it was. I knew them too, our dogs liked to play together, and I was easily able to understand what part of the track they were talking about, and I trusted them. They offered to come with me, but it was cold and late, and I didn't want to stress the little guy out by having so many people around it. So, I politely said no and that I got this. My area is very safe and I've had no problems walking out late at night or in the dark. So, I walked the 30 minutes up the hill into the reserve and I found the poor wallaby. He was so lethargic and didn't bother to move when I went right up to him. Now, he was a very large wallaby, definitely not a medium, and probably weighed around 45 kilos more than half my own body weight. I normally wouldn't do these rescues because I know it pushes my physical capabilities. So I gently maneuver him into the sack I had in my tub, tie it such with some cable ties and pop him in the tub. Now having grown up in the area and in the Australian bush, I am very very used to the sounds of the animals in the night, the scratching, movement, hissing, growling, etc. And since I had my head torch on the entire time. I could see where my feet were going. I was fine. You develop a sort of sixth sense by doing this. I knew the sound so well. I was a nighttime bush tour guide a few years before I got sick. And when I get a hair raising feeling on the back of my neck, I know something isn't right. And as sure as sure, every hair in my body seemed to stand on end. And I'm on the balls of my feet. I scanned the surrounding area, thinking that it might be a snake or a lost dog or something. Nothing. Confused but still trusting my gut, I slowly start to travel back down the trail. The wallaby is so heavy that I have to stop every few meters and put it down, to stop the tub from cutting into my hands. And then, there is a large crack in movement to my rear left. I spin around and start internally freaking out. That was no animal sound I knew. It had to be a person. It was way way too big and there was a sudden silence like whatever had made the noise it stopped or was stalking. I decided to just screw it and pulling on my gloves, hoisted the wallaby over my back, turned off my light, and started booking it down the trail sticking to the right side just along the edge of the trees leaving my tub behind. I doubt anybody would take it and honestly, 
I was freaking out so much that I couldn't care. Luckily, it was mostly downhill, so I got out there in maybe 20 minutes or so. Every now and then, I could hear a distinctive rustle or crunching of dead bark on the ground. That was way too big for any animal in my area, let alone one that would follow a human. The entire time, my instincts are yelling at me to run. Run, run. I was gripping the bag over my shoulder for dear life, and I didn't even stop when my shoulder was screaming to stop and rest. I made it out and down several streets, well into the tight knit neighborhood and into the light before I freaking dared to stop. I couldn't bring myself to look over my shoulder. I could feel someone watching me. I started to cry as I made my way home only a few streets away. I told my mom and she looked very worried and lightly scolded me for going out like that, even though we have both done this kind of thing before. I called up my best friend and she came over for the night and to come with me to try and find my rescue tub with me the next day. This morning, another rescuer came by to take the sick root of the vet, and me and Risa went back up to the bush, and we found it. The heavy duty plastic tub had been smashed up, like someone kept jumping on it. It was half intact. There were butts of what I could only assume were rolled cigarettes and a needle empty on the ground. I just silently picked up the broken tub and threw it away when I got home. I don't think that I'll be going out at night for a long, long time. To whoever or whatever was stalking me in the bush last night, let's not meet ever. To first start off, I live in a little city in SoCal with my roommate who happens to be my cousin. During the pandemic, however, I've been staying with my parents who live in a very small town in NorCal. Because of my time in SoCal, I really do not like staying in NorCal and I would rather live back to my apartment. The reason why I haven't done it is because my parents might think that I will get very lonely there since everything is closed down, and my roommate isn't there as he's with his parents as well. However, since I had to go back for a specific reason, my parents wanted me to take my dog there, Mocha, so I wouldn't feel as lonely staying there. I loved her so I didn't mind one bit. Mocha is a small, palmchy dog that loves to play around me and is usually by my side for most of the time. She also loves to go for runs with me so I occasionally do take her on jogs. On a Wednesday night, I decided to go running with her. Whenever I go on any runs, I go at night because that's the time I am most energetic. And all the times I went running at night, I never had any type of encounters or occurrences. I put Mocha on a leash and off we went. About 20 minutes into our run, I was running through this creek where there was a park next to it and a bunch of trees surrounding it, houses to the other side. The trail was pretty narrow and the street lamps were pretty dim, but still bright enough to see up ahead. As I'm running with music playing, my leash was tugged by Mocha. This usually happens when she wants to go to the bathroom so I stopped to let her do her thing. But when I turned around, she was in her alert stance looking straight behind where we had ran. I just assumed that she had heard a squirrel or some other small animal, as she usually does this when she sees one. I was tugging her leash telling her, let's go, there's nothing there. She didn't oblige at first, she just kept looking behind us. It took me about 4 or 5 tugs before she finally came to me. I resumed to play my music and we both went off running. I was almost out of the creek and then I would meet a narrow sidewalk that was straight ahead. The trail only had to take a few more short turns. Probably a minute or two later, Mocha tugged the leash again and went on her alert stance behind us. She did an aggressive bark and started growling. I stopped and was looking all around behind us. I was kind of freaked out because the trail had a couple turns and curves. This meant that something was most likely following us. My first guess was a lost dog which was unsettling because Mocha is tiny, 
If it was a big dog, it could easily overpower her. As I was looking around the dim area, for a split second, I got a black humanoid figure about 15 yards away from me, right behind a bush next to a tree. I immediately turned my eyes to the opposite direction, and pretending that I did not see him, but boy was my heart pounding. I didn't see any figures or his face, I just saw the outline of his upper body. I didn't have any weapons on me as a self-defense. If this guy is following me, my best solution is to run off without him trying to catch me. I tried to play it cool and I told Mocha, let's go. The trail was going to end, I just had to make it a turn and it would be a straight sidewalk that was about 300 or 400 yards. There are fences on both sides of the sidewalk so the only solution was to keep running forward. I went as a jog right as I turned the corner and made sure that I was out of view from the person I went on a full sprint as quietly as I could. The sidewalk was ahead of me so I made sure to just keep on running. I kept looking behind me to see if I was really being followed. About being 70 yards away, I saw a person come into view from the turn and then went sprinting as fast as he could towards me. As if I wasn't sprinting, I went and sprinted as fast as I could. I've never ran so fast in my life. Looking back, I'm amazed how quick I actually was. Mocha was keeping up with me about 100 yards of me sprinting. I looked back. The guy was still running behind me. He had a dark hoodie on, sweatpants, and appeared to be 6 feet tall. He was still in the same distance that I noticed him, which means that he was pretty fast as well. The sidewalk was going to end in, in about 100 yards and it would lead into my neighborhood. I could lose him in there. I was slowly getting out of breath. My adrenaline was beginning to die down. I kept sprinting, hoping that I wouldn't get too tired too quick. Another 100 yards of me sprinting, I finally made it to my neighborhood out of breath. This neighborhood was pretty broad. So, if I were to keep running, this person would have spotted me right away, and at the pace that he was running, it didn't seem like a good idea. My best solution was to hide. I went straight to a random house and jumped over to their backyard, where I would be kept hidden behind the fence. I basically threw Mocha over and myself. We were both panting, but I tried to keep quiet as I heard footsteps coming by. The guy had finished the trail and was now in the neighborhood. He stopped running and I heard him panting. I was hearing him mutter as he was out of breath. He kept saying, crap, what the heck? I was holding Mocha scratching her so she wouldn't bark or growl. About five minutes later, I heard footsteps walking away and then slowly fading. I waited about 10 minutes in complete silence to be sure that he wasn't close by. I peeked my head around the fence and I was all alone now. I got Mocha and went to the opposite direction from where I had heard the guy go. Even though I was tired, I tried to jog just so I could get home sooner. I kept looking around me. I was very paranoid that the guy would be there somewhere. I made it back home with no problem. And I've got to thank Mocha for pretty much telling me that someone was behind me and stalking us. I don't know how long he was following us or what he was planning on doing. I just hope that he didn't get a clear glimpse of my face because I don't want to run up on him again. When I was 18, I was living in a small town. I was friends with the ratty skaters around and they helped connect with this dude who sold weed. He was 29 I think at the time and gave me pretty good deals and lived nearby. I wasn't driving at the time so this was convenient for me. His name was Max. Max had always struck me as a weird dude, but I honestly quite liked his weirdness. Not in a romantic way or anything, but I like weird people. We had normal weed buying interactions that never lasted more than 10 minutes. Buy some weed and maybe smoke a bowl and that's it. 
He would often tell me that he could drop it off at my house, but I never let him because, as I said before, he was weird. I wasn't afraid of him, but was definitely aware that he and his offers to deliver were weird. One day in May 2018, I was invited to a bonfire by these same ratty skaters that had introduced me to this guy. I had no idea that he would be there, nor was it important to me at all. I brought the guy that I was dating at the time. I said hey to everyone, including Max. We stayed for a couple of hours and some of them played some music on their guitars. Nearing the time that I was leaving the bonfire around 11pm, Max was getting upset about something and threw his guitar to the bonfire. I didn't know what he was angry or upset about and paid no mind to it. This happened as I was leaving with the guy that I was dating. I went to bed and woke up to paragraphs on paragraphs of crazy text messages from Max, ranging from 1am to 5am, like a constant stream of text, stating things such as, you know how much I loved you, you are cruel. He would go back and forth between saying, I would give you the world if you let me, and you really do deserve him though. He said really scary things like, you're an awful person and you should be snubbed out, just wait, winky face, and you are stuck. I will either love you or hate you to the fullest extent that my powers behold. Right now I pay you the worst death on you and your boyfriend. And to top it all off, he said, Losing you is like losing a mother to me. And he told me to tell him that I never loved him and that I wouldn't hear from him again if I did. So that's what I did. I said that I never loved you and do not message me again. And I left it at that. I didn't get a response, nor did I care to get one. Max had never expressed any romantic interest, asked me out or anything. This was all out of nowhere and he was 11 years older than me. I was barely 18. That night he cut his long hair off and posted photos naked on Facebook, curled up in a fetal position talking about being a statue of shame. It's as if he had had a breakdown, but I had no intention of causing that, and I didn't think that I would even offend anyone by bringing the guy that I was seeing. Everyone else seemed to like the guy that I brought. About a week later, Max texted me pretty late at night and asked if I had seen the flowers that he spread along my sidewalk, stating that he stole every flower in the vicinity of my neighborhood that night. I asked how he knew where I lived and he said that I hadn't seen the flowers so he must have had the wrong house. I also told him that he shouldn't do that, as I never felt anything for him and so on. He told me that he had heard I lived on the same block as another one of these skater guys we were both friends with and he wasn't wrong. The skater guy that I lived by was on the other side of the block and I never walked that way, so I never saw the flowers. I blocked his number and didn't hear from him again for weeks. Weeks later, I woke up after a rough night and there were loads of flowers on the sidewalk right outside of my house along with a little bouquet at the top of my walkway. I was pissed, I wasn't scared yet and stupidly. I am blocked his number and texted him asking why the heck there were flowers outside of my house. This confirmed that this indeed was where I lived. I still to this day feel so stupid for texting him and making it known that after weeks he had found my house. He responded saying, Hmm, that sounds nice. Twas me. I yelled at him, basically, and I blocked his number again. About a week later, I was out of town and my roommate texted me a photo of a heart with a peace sign inside of it, and my name written under it drawn in chalk outside of our house. When I got back into town, I went to the courthouse and began the process of getting a restraining order against him. And when I left the courthouse, I went to Max's work and told him he needed to stop this behavior, and that he was stalking me. He looked me in the eyes with no facial expression and said, If you don't leave, I'm calling the cops. I got angry and said loudly, Call the cops. I was just talking to them about you, and left his work in a rage. Soon after this, I began driving again. I once drove by him and he noticed that it was me. The next day, I woke up with my car covered in flowers. I presented my case to the judge and she put the stalking order in place. He was served with it by police officers and I thought that that was it, and that he wouldn't be bothering me again. 
I was wrong. After the stocking order was served, he made several other chalk messages on my sidewalk, left random gifts for me like chalk and beheaded My Little Pony heads on beer bottles. I always brought these things to the police station but they said that I needed to catch him doing it, to take a photo or get a security camera. So I got a security camera and really hoped that I would catch him. It turned out that my camera was stupid and I couldn't just watch the videos that it took, but I had to skip through second by second by hand. It was an impossible task. I was terrified of leaving my house at night at this point. I never had my curtains open anymore and I was so frustrated that my livelihood was being taken away from me. Ultimately, I blocked his number in hopes that he would text me directly violating the stalking order and after a few days, it did work. He sent me a weird text saying something like, Forgive me, we are charming and this is harming, let's try again. By now, it's September 2018 and he finally goes to jail. He's facing up to a year in jail and has to stay there until their court date. I finally start calming down and I'm able to go outside at night, even if it's just to get in my car. I let myself have my curtains open sometimes. I'm starting to feel alive again. Right when I start feeling more secure in my small town life again, someone posted bail and he was released after only three months in jail and I went back to living in fear. We still had court dates coming up and I was optimistic that he would serve more time for ruining my life for so long. His lawyer kept pushing the court date back to gather evidence and after about six months of pushing it back, the state decided he wouldn't do anything more and he closed the case basically. I had moved out of town three plus hours away at this point, so he didn't actually have an option to continue this behavior. Living in this new place, I feel safe. I can walk at night and don't have to have my curtains closed all the time. It's been over a year since they decided to close the case. About a month ago, he began responding to my friend's Instagram stories, friends that live here in this new town, telling them how fond he is of me and so on. My voice had him blocked, but my Instagram isn't private, so he must have found them out that way. I have since changed my account to private and he hasn't messaged any more friends of mine. I have refused to be fearful now, the way that I was then. He will never find where I live or where I work now. However, my life is forever changed after this experience. I will always be more aware of people and their weird energy. I will always close my curtains early in the evening and make sure that all my windows and doors are locked. I will always live a little bit in fear, maybe not of him, but of it happening again. He ruined my life for a year and I truly wish that he had gotten that time in jail. He deserves it. To start, I need to give some context. I was taking a greyhound across the country as I was moving to seek assistance with mental health care. I had a deep scratches on my face from a disassociative episode a couple of days prior to this event. This is a random detail, but it'll be important for a story dialogue. Obligatory, this happened back at the beginning of February. I had gotten stuck in Dallas due to my final bus being delayed by two days. I went online and booked a hotel to stay overnight, and would catch a flight out the following morning. The hotel had nice pictures and decent reviews online. It seemed legit. I took an Uber from the station to the hotel. It all started as I had arrived. There was a man standing outside of the lobby talking on his phone. I went in and he followed, still on the phone. I thought nothing of it as I assumed he was just waiting to get assistance at the front desk. I checked in and discovered the room that I was staying in was in the back of the lot. This hotel was filled with full suites and all of them had private entrances. It was essentially set up as a huge apartment area. The man walked back outside as I was finishing up the check-in process. I got my key and headed out of the lobby to walk across the lot. I had a big suitcase filled with everything that I could fit. I also had a weighted blanket. It was a struggle to wrangle them both and after two days straight to being on a bus. It was difficult for me to wrangle at all and I dropped my suitcase and blanket. The man watched me as I picked everything up in front of him. Uh, do you need any help with that? He asked. I told him that I was fine, but thank you for the offer. 
Once I got my stuff gathered again, I began my long journey of walking towards the back of the lot to get into my room. And the man followed. So, are you from Dallas? He began. No, sorry. And then I wasn't and wasn't planning on staying longer than the evening. He followed me in silence for a moment, so I asked how long he was going to be in Dallas. As we're in a hotel lot, and I assumed that he would be passing by as well. Nah, I'm from here, he answered. Red flag number one, enter gut feeling. I told him it was weird that he was at a hotel then, and still continued to walk. Hoping my lack of conversation would give him the hint to leave me alone, but he was persistent. We had small talk for a moment and I paused walking to take a look at the room number again. I was obviously lost and not sure where I was going, thanks to the vague details of the front desk representative. What room are you in? He asked. I told him the building, hoping that he would point to me in the right direction and finally lead me to be on my way. He told me that he knew where that was and said to continue going straight. It was the last building on the right. Great, but red flag number two. Why was he so familiar with the hotel's lot layout? I told him thank you and pressed on. He continued to follow. Told me he wanted to make sure that I made it to my room okay. I responded by telling him that it wasn't necessary, but I had appreciated the offer. He wasn't listening. We walked for a few feet and a van pulled up. Hold up, he said. I gotta stop at this car quick. I was relieved, and I was sure he would get distracted by conversation and finally leave me be. I looked around the lot, trying to spot a building number and make sure that I was headed in the right direction. As I was checking my surroundings to gauge my location, I saw that a woman hopped out of the van. She handed him money and hopped back in the van and left. No more than a minute passed and the interaction was over. I didn't get to make it that far and he was jogging back toward me. Red flag number three. So you're here for business then, I said. He then proceeded to ask me what I meant. You're trapping, I saw what just happened. He was silent but still continued to follow me. He then asked me what made me think that. I peeped that transaction, I'm not stupid. I've got street smarts and I'm more cultured than meets the eye. He told me that he was impressed by how observant and aware I was. I'm not interested in joining your business, now leave me alone, I'm not the one, I then told him. He laughed and proceeded to tell me that he could help me make a lot of money. Red flags validated. I told him that I wasn't interested in making money with him. I then stated that I wasn't going to snitch at him and that he's good to do him. I then stopped again to gauge where I was. The lot was getting darker the further back we went. I then repeated again that he didn't need to walk me to my room. I'm not interested in trapping and told him to go put that energy elsewhere. He then proceeded to tell me that he was just interested in making friends, and not everyone in the world is malicious. I told him that that may be true, but I'm severely distrusting of people. I mentioned that I keep my circle small and wasn't looking to expand it. Dang, he replied. At this point, my mouth was popping off. I turned on the attitude, as nicely telling him to screw off wasn't getting through his thick head. Again, we walked in silence for a moment. You don't have to be so mean, he began. You're really beautiful. What happened to your face? Why do you have those scratches? I then decided to try and intimidate him or scare him away. I did it to myself, I told him. Why? You're too beautiful for that girl. Don't do that to your face. You'll take away from your beauty, he replied. He then asked what I was doing in Dallas and wanted to know what I was doing that night. I told him no and that I was on my way to the loony bin because I'm freaking crazy. I then stated that he didn't want these problems. And again, I'm not the one. I'm almost there. He ended up following me to my room, continuously telling me that he wanted to get to know me and that he wasn't going to hurt me. I kept up my attitude with my responses and declining his advances. He followed me all the way to my room. I couldn't roll my suitcase in and again, I ended up dropping my things. He picked them up and I opened the door. He then just walked into the suite and put my things in the living area. 
Thanks, I guess, I told him, keeping the door open behind me. He then mentioned again that we should hang out that evening. I declined once more and mentioned that I have a flight out in the morning. I was mostly interested in going to bed. He stood across the room from me and again we found ourselves sitting in silence. So, you really don't want to be friends, he said. Again repeating that he wasn't going to hurt me and that not everybody in the world is bad. I was sick of it at this point and told him to leave. He sat on the couch in the living area, unfazed by my attitude towards him. You smoke? I can roll this one, he offered. I'd have to go back to my room to get it for us. Perfect, I thought. If I say yes, I can get him out, turn out all the lights and not answer the door when he comes back. I told him, sure, go get it. He then asked if I would let him hit it when he gets back. I busted out laughing and told him, no, nah, I'm not the one. I told you that I don't want to make money with you. For those of you who may not be familiar with what's going on, he was trying to take me for a test drive. A pimp's got to test his goods before he distributes the product. A poor time makes for bad business. I may have seemed cool as a cucumber on the outside, but inside, I was shook by this whole situation and felt extremely uncomfortable. Again, he told me how much money I would make. At this point, alarms were blaring in my head. This man needed to leave. This had gone too far and I didn't feel right. What's your name? I asked. He told me a street name. Nah, I don't play that. Give me your ID. If I was about to get kidnapped or murdered, that information would be crucial. He did. His name was Donovan. I noted his birth date and tried to retain the ID number. I handed his ID back to him. We sat in silence once more, him still on the couch, me standing by the still open door, my eyes never diverting from him, watching his every move. So you're not going to let me hit it then? He asked. Once again, I rejected the statement and said that he could leave any time. I also reminded him that I'm freaking crazy and he should probably leave me because he was pissing me off at this point. I wanted to go to bed. I wanted to get out of fight or flight mode. I wanted to beat the crap out of this man. To be honest, looking back, I think he liked the attitude. I flipped the switch and turned off the attitude and then decided to tell him, you know what, yeah, we can chill, go roll the blunt, I could use one. We can chat and get to know each other, see where it leads. He smiled and said, alright, cool, and told me that he would be back. I immediately closed and locked the door behind him, texted his information to a couple of friends and my mom without context, grabbed a knife from the kitchen, and checked to make sure that all the windows were locked. At this point, it had been an hour since I had checked in. It took about 20 minutes to walk to and find my room from the front of the lot. The rest of the time was spent convincing him to leave my room. All this time, my mom had been blowing me up, worried that I didn't make it to my hotel safely. I called her and explained what had happened. She then proceeded to hang up on me, call the front desk, demanded I get a room next to the lobby, and alerted them of what happened to me. I don't know if he ever came back as the manager was there within minutes and drove me to my new room. She apologized and stated that the man was there often and never caused any problems. This statement raised more questions than answers for me. I am an avid hiker, and when I can't make the hour plus long drives up to the mountains, I enjoy the nice hikes near my home. This one particular hike near my home is 5 miles in many different directions, like a goosebumps book of sorts for hiking. You can only see the trees and the greenery on one hike, or a massive waterfall on another, follow the river on another, see the abandoned and dilapidated mills from decades ago, etc. I went to the waterfall this time. I was about two and a half miles in and I sat down and did some work, enjoying the serenity. When I was ready to leave, I looked around and saw a family, a father and mother and three kids near me. I packed my things back in my day pack as they left. I am a major people hater. 
I prefer to hike in areas where there are no people for miles. I chose to go a different way back to the trailhead than the way I came because I didn't want to run into this family for the next two and a half miles. I checked my map on my cell phone and found a route that I could take back that seemed remote enough. I immediately noticed that this trail was not man-made, but just probably what was left after some flooding. It was going upriver away from the waterfall, and I was so close to the river, all I had to do was walk out onto a bent tree and I could touch the water. It was a very thin trail, not big enough for people to walk side by side, and it was covered in thick roots. I enjoyed this and it was peaceful. I passed them girls who had hooked up hammocks to read in about 20 feet to my right after I had hiked this little path for a while, and I had nothing but the sound of the slow flowing river to my left, until I heard lots of footsteps coming from behind me. I didn't want to deal with the people behind me so I stepped out onto a tree that hung over the river and waited for them to pass. It was that dang family from the waterfall. I could have sworn that they went the complete opposite direction, but whatever. I waited a few minutes before I started walking again. I did not want to run into them. Pretty soon, their voices had disappeared in the distance, and I was able to go back to enjoying the peace and beauty around me. I hiked for another five or so minutes when I had to turn a sharp corner around a boulder at a major bend in the river. This man, the father, was standing there on the other side, crouched down, like he wanted to scare me. I screamed and he laughed. I got really angry and I noticed that his family were nowhere near us. I yelled, What the heck is wrong with you? At him, not bothering to control my anger, being snuck up on by some stupid human. But he wouldn't stop laughing. Now I realized that I was dealing with an idiot or a psychopath and I didn't want to deal with either. So I turned around and I booked it. I could hear him behind me, following me. He wasn't a very big man. He stood about 5'6 and was around 180 to 200 pounds. But he was keeping pace about 20 feet behind me. Let me tell you that this path is not for running. I very nearly went sideways into the river a few times, but this gave me a few ideas too. The routes that I could mostly handle, I knew the terrain in the park pretty well. As long as I focused on my quickly placed steps around the thick root systems and keeping my balance, I could make it. I was running backwards towards the waterfall, downriver, where surely there would be people around. It was a straight shot. But then, I remembered the hammock girls and I remembered that they were slightly hidden and if I picked up the speed, dude behind me would miss me turning because of the natural curves of this path. I sprinted on the trail and I burst into the hammock girls area. I sputtered out a quick and quiet explanation, a man following me, and they hid me behind the lowest hammock. Took us 5-10 to 10 seconds max to set up. And the three of us watched as this guy ran past not long after I was safely hidden. I stayed with the girls for another few minutes just to be safe, explaining the situation, catching my breath, and then went back the way that I came from, upriver. I did not want to run into this dude again. Oh, but you think this is over? No. As I again hiked upriver on the trail, my original remote path back to the trailhead, I tried to calm myself down. I just couldn't get my mind to stop thinking that I was being followed. I just tried to hurry and get out of there as fast as I could. I turned a sharp right at the boulder that the man was hiding behind before and kept pushing through the rough trail. I tried to focus on the sound of the river that was still to my left but I couldn't get the sound of my heart out of my ears. And then crunching. The sound of my pounding heart morphed into the sound of footsteps in an instant. 
I realized that I was being followed again. I looked back and guess who? This dang father again. I got mad as hell. I stopped and turned around. I yelled at him to stop following me and I screamed bloody murder at him. I yelled profanities at him. I threw a dang pine cone at him. He smiled a toothy grin and kept walking slowly towards me as it bounced off his shoulder. He wasn't phased by any of it. He just kept smiling as if we were an old friend. What he did not know is that I am an army combat veteran and a domestic violence survivor. I have PTSD from both and I have skills that many don't have. Dude chose the wrong girl to mess with that day. I had had enough. I already hate people enough but this guy was just crossing a million lines into my freaking territory. So I charged at him. He finally wiped that stupid look off his face. I was seeing red at that point because I will not be made to feel unsafe in the only place I've felt safe since I've got divorced or went to war. Forget that dude. Seriously, F that dude. I ran directly at him and knocked him down with the full force of my body crashing into him. I screamed at him as I hit him blindly. I grabbed his hair in the waistband of the back of his pants and started dragging him to the edge of the trail. He was the one yelling at me this time. Every time he fought back, I gave him a swift kick. I gave him several explanations for why his behavior was so stupid. And then I unceremoniously kick pushed him into the river. I told him to cool off in the water and to not come out until I was long gone. I turned back in the direction that I had been walking before and decided that I needed to take another detour just to be safe from getting away from him, and also to get the F away from people. I knew there was a trail parallelish to the one that I was on to my right, and I looked around for a clear place to climb up the steep hill, which was mostly granite and moss and ivy. I hadn't planned on impromptu rock climbing that day, but whatever. I found a spot and started climbing until I got scared of my wits again by three guys just sitting in the middle of this hill on a very small mossy flat spot smoking weed. They were completely hidden. Once I caught my breath again from the shock and the climbing, I asked if they had heard me screaming and they said that they did, but that they thought that I had it covered. I rolled my eyes and told them to kick anyone down the hill that tried to follow me and I continued on. Freaking stoners, man. It took me a while to cover the two and a half miles back to the trailhead that day, because I kept looking back, taking detours, hiding randomly. But when I did, I called the cops and alerted the park ranger about the guy. I don't know any other details on that. The cop laughed and said, Hey, good for you, when I told him what I did. I honestly doubt they did much because I never heard back. I haven't been back to that place since, sadly. I just want to state before I post this that I don't agree with any violence, but it was getting out of hand there without it. I just wanted to hike in peace and I would absolutely prefer if I could do it alone and safely. Also, thanks Cheez-Its for those hammock girls. Also, plus one, if that man was you, F off you creep. A few months back, my girlfriend and I were bored hanging around the house and spontaneously decided to go for a hike. We don't go hiking often, but the idea appealed to both of us. And even though there was only about an hour of daylight left, we figured we had enough time to go enjoy a hike before it got too dark. We quickly filled up our water bottles and put on the best walking shoes we had, and we were out the door, driving up into the mountains. Around my area, there are many hiking trails with the variety of trails increasing as you go up in the mountains. We tended to stay around the base of the mountains in the occasional case of us hiking, where most people would still be walking, but we wanted to change things up and regressed further up the mountain road to a trail a friend of mine had mentioned. We kept in mind our time and figured that we could hike for a bit and simply enjoy the nice environment around us and finish up before it was too late. 
We arrived at the trailhead and see that there were no cars left along the road, where the trail commences, but didn't think much of it due to the time. We still had a good 45 minutes until dark, so we continued on. We start walking down a fairly steep hill that then recoups the elevation at the bottom, with an equally steep hill that you have to ascend. We reach the top and then it's smooth sailing from there. We see a lone coyote off the trail a ways off and some rabbits, and I made a quip about how those rabbits might need to be careful with that coyote lurking around, and she playfully hit me for that one. Approximately less than a mile into the trail, we see a large, fallen tree that made a bridge over a dried riverbed, and decided to take a rest and climb around on it and take pictures. We're there for about 10 minutes and then resume hiking. We continue on the trail for a short distance until she hears a rustle in the trees behind us. We stop, mildly spooked due to the assumed size of whatever made that rustling, but continue on only briefly before she decides she's done and that we need to head back. It's twilight now, so I agree with her and we turn around to head back to the car. When we made it back to the fallen tree, my shoe had come untied, so I used the trunk to fix my loose laces and look behind us for the first time on the hike. It's uncharacteristic of me, but hey, I was having fun. Why be paranoid? I see a person dressed entirely in black with her hood on that was a significant distance behind us, walking at a slow, even pace. It wasn't something out of the ordinary, so what if they're wearing black with their hood on? I wear black most of the time and it's cold out. I shouldn't make assumptions. This does trigger me to be more alert, however, and I inform my girlfriend of this person's presence. It's now dusk. We continue on at an intentionally faster pace and go through a winding section of the trail and I lose sight of the person. When we come around the final bend of the section, I figure they're far behind us and that there's nothing to worry about. Sooner than later, the person is behind us again, but much closer, probably 50 feet in comparison to 100 feet before, and we had increased our speed so this alarmed us. We briskly walk around another bend and as soon as we come around it, we book it. It seemed to be a natural reaction on both of our parts as we just started running without a word said to initiate it. We are nearing the trail at now, with only the hills to deal with. We catch our breath for a moment and I turn around again. I see the person seemingly halt a sprint upon noticing me looking back, as if they were trying to uphold the illusion of simply walking. At this point I shout, Go! and we sprint down the hill. What little light was left struggled to make its way through the dense trees surrounding us, and the steep hill proved challenging to run down without a clear path to be seen. We both stumbled on the hill, almost falling multiple times and slamming our feet onto rocks and loose brush, but we didn't fall and we didn't look behind us. We made it to the bottom, but must continue up the initial hill and then we will have made it out. We persevere up the incline and make it back to our car. I briefly breathe in relief as I start my car, heart pounding and adrenaline racing. As I reverse out onto the road, the person emerges at the trailhead, apparently breathing heavily. We finally get a glimpse of him. His hood had fallen off his head exposing his pale complexion and dead eyes that were only illuminated by a single lantern at the start of the trail. He was holding something in his hand, but it was too dark to see and I was not interested in sticking around to make out the object. I shift into drive and accelerate as fast as my car could muster, leaving him behind in the dust of the empty side of the road. This happened last fall when the weather was cooling down but wasn't too cold. I was going through a breakup and having a rough time in life in general and I was seeking ways to become more independent and grow myself. So, 
I decided to run to a park 30 minutes away from my city to enjoy the sunset. This was in November, so the park was almost completely empty. I passed two cars while driving in. One was empty, but I noticed that the second car I passed was parked in the parking lot, with the headlights on. I couldn't see how many people were inside, but I instantly got a bad feeling. Whatever I told myself, I was being silly and that I shouldn't let stupid fear prevent me from enjoying the sunset. So I drove all the way into the park and parked my car in the parking lot where the road ended. I still had a nasty feeling when I parked, but the sun was still up and it wasn't dark. And I just wanted to get out for 5 minutes and hike up the trail to sit outside. I told myself there was nothing to worry about and I didn't need to be suspicious unless the car followed me to the parking lot. I waited a couple of minutes and nothing happened. So I left my car and I headed up the trail. I honest to god didn't go that far. I walked for maybe 2 minutes up to a bench at an overlook and sat for 5 or 10 minutes. It started to get a little bit darker since the sun had gone down. Think like early dusk. And so I turned around and I walked the 2 minutes back down the path to the parking lot. There was a little bend in the path before it got to the lot and as soon as I rounded the bend, my stomach fell. The car was sitting between the trailhead and my car. I can't even describe just how terrifying that feeling was. I knew something was wrong in that very moment. I called my mom and then I called the police and asked them to come to my car because I didn't feel safe returning to my car alone. For reference, I am a short and skinny girl. After speaking to the police officer, I called my mom again and stayed on the phone with her for 30 minutes waiting up the trail for an officer. Those minutes were some of the most dreadful minutes I had ever experienced. It was a park so there were coyotes howling nearby and an owl. It was getting darker every second and I was just staring down the path waiting for whoever was in the car to decide to come looking for me. After what felt like an eternity, an officer finally arrived. I saw his lights and finally headed back down the trail to my car. Sure enough, there was a man sitting in the driver's side of the car in the lot. The officer told me the man was just sleeping, but I'm not so sure. I passed his car while I was driving and he followed my car to the parking lot that I was in. There were plenty of empty lots to sleep in. If somebody decided to sleep in their car in a park, which I think is illegal anyway, I don't think they would choose to park right next to another car. Not to mention, I had only been away from my car for maybe 15 minutes at the most, and he had parked between the trailhead and my car. So, he would see me return to my car and I would have to pass him before I could get into my vehicle. The whole situation scared me from ever going to the park alone again. So, stranger in the woods, please, let's not meet. This happened two years ago, August 11th, 2018, and since the anniversary just passed, I thought I should finally share this story. My fiance and I were on the second night of our two night camping trip at a popular campground about a half hour from where we live. On our first night, we kept hearing noises in the woods around us. The campsite right beside ours to the right was occupied, but the one to the left was not. The campsites are about 150 yards apart and we had camped here in the same exact plot the year before. Needless to say, we were familiar with the area and the various kinds of animals that live in the woods. The first night, we heard shuffling around our tent. It was obviously something large moving around. We brushed it off and assumed it was just a deer. Now back to the main event. On August 11th, we spent the day at the battlefields a town over with my family. They had all been invited to join us for the day by my fiancé, as a surprise for me while he proposed to me. 
and we stayed with my family until the evening, about 6 p.m., before heading back to our campsite. When we got back, things were really odd. Someone had obviously been in our tent. Our blankets were thrown around, clothes were on the floor, and my backpack had been rearranged and I was missing underwear. But hey, we were stupid 19 year olds and decided that since whoever had busted in had left and hadn't taken anything important, it was fine and they wouldn't come back. So we set up a campfire and sat out until it was dark, roasting hot dogs and s'mores, smoking cigarettes and celebrating our engagement. Around 9.30pm, we put out a fire and decided to go into our tent for the night to celebrate a little more. Nothing too loud or obnoxious. Immediately after we finished, we started to hear the noises outside of our tent again, but this time we focused in. We heard a clear footsteps and at one point a man whispering. We looked at each other and our eyes got wide. Someone was definitely walking outside of our tent. We were still and completely silent, just listening to the footsteps and we heard whispering again. Crap. Make that two men walking around our tent. As if we had the ability to read minds, my fiance said, I have to go to the bathroom. And I agreed. The bathroom was up the hill from our site. Most people who were in lower sites like ours drove their cars up to the bathroom. Now, here is the part I still get chills thinking about. We got up and were getting dressed. My fiance had just turned on the light in our tent and put his binder on when a man spoke directly to us from right outside of the tent. What are you doing? I can't even describe how malicious and menacing the voice sounded. It was clearly directed at us and he said it with a snicker. He was watching us through the walls of the tent. Again, for this part, we were stupid 19 year olds, so we decided to just run for it to the car. My fiance grabbed his pocket knife and his keys and stepped out of the tent. He pulled me with him and we ran like hell to the car. I heard footsteps running behind us and then turning and running up to another campsite. At the bathroom, we talked over our options. We talked about sleeping in the car or driving into the town. And then we had another idea. We drove back to our campsite and began packing everything into the car. At this point, it was around midnight. We moved faster than I think either of us thought possible, wrapping up the tent with our belongings still in it and grabbing our folding chairs. We were all packed in five minutes and hopped into the car to leave. I jumped out at the end of the drive and grabbed our nameplate, which had my full name on it, off of the post. As we pulled out of the campsite, I saw our assailants for the first time. Stalking through the woods onto our campsite were two tall white men. I realized that these were the same men who had been driving past our campsite the whole time that we were there, just glaring at us and muttering to each other. One was wearing camo hunting gear, and the other was wearing a confederate flag tank top. Both were carrying large hunting knives, unsheathed and at the ready. They turned when I saw our car driving away and one started to make chase while the other stopped him. I made eye contact with the man in camo, and he smiled the most terrifyingly evil smile at me and shook his head slowly. We drove the long way home, taking all the weirdest, hardest to follow roads and called my dad so he would know that we were coming. When we got home, we told my dad everything and he shrugged it off as us being paranoid. So I never told anyone else besides all of you now. I am convinced to this day that this was going to be a racially motivated attack. The campground was not heavily populated and my fiancé was the only non-white person at any of the campsites. It was no accident that the two men who had been shadowing us since our arrival and wore confederate flags and had one on their truck decided to target the interracial couple. I still get cold chills when I think about how close we were to being killed or seriously hurt that night, and just how lucky we were that our reckless plan to just make a run for it worked. So, to those two men who start their campsite with the hunting knives, let's not meet.
It was the summer right after I had graduated from high school. A good friend and I decided to try our hand at camping. We grew up in the greater Los Angeles area, so our knowledge of the great outdoors was nothing beyond the couple years we had in Cub Scouts of America, back when we were in elementary school. In other words, we had almost no idea what we were doing. We packed a tent, a couple of sleeping bags, supplies, etc., and headed off in his car. Note to all that, I grew up in the 80s, so this is a time before the wide prevalence of cell phones and the existence of other portable digital devices. We drove north on the 395 for about 6 hours and then headed westward into the mountains in the area of Inyo Canyon. First mistake. We didn't plan on which place to camp. We played it by ear like fools. Second mistake. We left in mid-afternoon. It was pitch black darkness when we arrived in the general area. We had driven off the main road and onto a dirt road in order to find a spot to camp. The dust from driving on the dirt road overwhelmed the headlight high beams when we finally decided to pull over and set up camp. It was around 11.30 at the time, and we were exhausted and famished. Any place was a good spot to camp for us given our only reason to do so at this point was our hunger and exhaustion. Third mistake. We didn't bring flashlights. We only had Bic lighters for our cigarettes. We tried to set up the tent using our lighters and the headlights of the car, which was parked about 10-15 to 15 feet away. The wind was blowing so the lighter constantly went out after a few seconds, either directly because of the wind or indirectly because the wind would push the flame into our thumb. Clearly, we were being camping idiots. We finished setting up the tent, but at that point I was too tired to eat. My friend managed to make some instant ramen. We smoked a cigarette in the car and then crashed out in the tent. We awoke to a very cold morning. It had to have been around 5.30. Immediately upon exiting the tent, we realized that we were camped at the entrance of a hiking trail. There were at least two no camping signs in visible distance from us. We dismantled the tent, cleaned up, and cleared out. That morning, we ended up buying some cheap flashlights and a nice hot meal in a very small town. It wasn't really a town, but more like a few storefronts and shops on a main road, about the length of an average city block. We went into some office although I don't really recall what it was. It might have been a park ranger station, or the office headquarters for a campground. In any case, we found and reserved a site for the night. The campground was basically like a large circle with campsites along its outer circumference, with each campsite being about 50 yards from its neighbor. In the middle of the circle was a common bathroom and shower, we circled around it once more, and I think we saw one family that was all set up with a tent and camper. We found our spot and we set up camp, which was quite far from them. That night which was when we had a creepy encounter. My friend and I were laying in the tent, shining our flashlights upwards and chatting. Our new flashlights eventually gave out, yes, broken. Our fire pit was about six feet from the opening of our tent. It was just a glowing ember. We probably should have completely put it out, and we probably shouldn't have had the tent so close. In any case, there we were, chatting away and having a good time. My friend began to be distracted with his foot. After the third or fourth time he got up to check his foot, I asked him what was wrong. He told me that something is tapping his foot from the outside of the tent. His foot was against the side of the tent. So, from the outside, you would have been able to see a bulge in the tent side where his foot was. It was as if pebbles were being thrown at his foot through the tent. There it is again. What the heck? Each time it happened, there is a sound. Like pebbles or a light tap. We sort of laughed it off, assuming that it was a twig or grass moving in the wind. Or, perhaps, a loose strap on the outside of the tent. I don't recall exactly how it happened at first, but I do remember we suddenly became silent at the same time. A sound came to be audible to the both of us. 
footsteps slowly moving towards our tent. We wondered if it was a bear or other non-human animal, but it seemed distinctly bipedal. They were very slow and measured, like a step every two seconds. I finally said in a whisper, Someone's coming. My friend didn't move. His face had an expression of fear. At some point, my friend bolted up and said, Forget this. He grabbed his pipe, stuffed it full of pots and marijuana, and took the biggest, deepest drags I've ever seen a person take. About a minute or two later, he was out. Drugs aren't my thing, so I was alone in the tent as far as conscious bodies are concerned. I was sitting up at this point, and I had taken out the only weapon that I had, a Swiss Army pocket knife. I took out the big and small blades, as well as the ice pick in the middle, and held it like some ridiculous melee weapon. I could see the glowing embers in the fire pit through the sheer nylon material of our tent, and I was able to roughly but barely discern some of the rocks around it. I watched and listened intently. The footsteps came closer and at the same slow pace. With each step, I could hear the dirt and rocks underfoot crunching and grinding. At some point, it was clear to me that whoever it was was standing between the tent and the fire pit. For my fuzzy line of sight to the burning embers through the nylon tent became obscured by someone outside the tent. The footsteps stopped right at the front of the tent, about six to eight inches, no more than a foot, from the entrance to the tent. It was silent for about one minute and then I heard a click. At exactly the same time, I clearly saw through the nylon tent wall a flashlight turn on. I was able to see not just the flashlight, but the outline of the hand holding it. The flashlight was shining on the zipper entrance into the tent, just inches from the zipper. Blood drained out of my head and my palms instantly became dripping in sweat. I yelled, Who's there? There was some fear in my voice, but it was mostly aggressive in tone. Whoever it was, the person immediately turned off their flashlight. I didn't move, but neither did they. The person just stood there inches from the tent's only entrance. My friend is out, totally unaware of what's going on. Nevertheless, I pretended that he was still awake and whispered just loud enough to be audible to our visitor. Yes, loaded. There's one in the chamber. As if my friend was awake and asked me about our gun. Fourth mistake. We didn't have a gun or any real weapon for self-defense. It felt like an eternity, but after sitting still for at least ten minutes, I heard feet slowly turning into the dirt and then slowly walking away from the tent. I stayed up the whole night, and it wasn't until the light of dawn came through the tent that I crashed out. The heat inside of the tent woke us up, and it was near noon by this point. We went outside to inspect the site, but found nothing missing. However, we did find boot prints leading away from our campsite and outside of the campground. That was the last time I camped in a tent. For a little background story, I am a scout since I am 8 years old, and last year I was the leader of my team so I had to do all the paperwork and calls for finding places to camp. It was mid-November and I had to find a place to camp, but since I was lazy I decided to wait a week before the actual weekend. A week before the weekend, I decided to call some owners so I could have a place to sleep. As I call many numbers, all the owners are unavailable or simply not there. But then I see a number which I had never called before, since it was at the end of the list. I called it and an old lady picked up the phone. I do the basics presentations and all, and she agreed to let me and my team stay at hers and we're making agreements. The afternoon, I go to her property to check everything such as potable water, the place to put the tent on the campfire. The place is kind of dark, but it's nice. The week passes and Saturday finally arrives. The Saturday is going well and we had some great games and ate a lot, 
and we had a good night show. As they go to sleep in the tent, I stay away to finish paperwork for the next day. It was now about midnight and I decided to go to sleep because we had to wake up early to go to church. As I switched off the flashlight, one of my newbies, we are eight in total, wanted to go to the bathroom, aka a tree, and asked me to come with her. I can understand because it's better to be accompanied at night, especially in the woods. Well, she does her business and I suddenly hear some noises far away, but not that far. I tell myself that it's nothing. It must be some animals trying to find food. We go back to the tent, and that's when I hear footsteps approaching. As I hear those footsteps, I remain calm and tell myself, Maybe it's the old lady, just checking to see if we made a fire too close to the tent or something. But I still had an odd feeling because it's been night, and why would she do it at this hour? Then I hear no more footsteps for about 10 minutes, and then I hear more coming to her tent. Thankfully, all of my girls are sleeping, because they would have been scared. I was the oldest and they were about 3 or 4 years younger than me. As I hear footsteps would seem to come from one person, I hear others coming from the back of the tent, and I was like, okay, this is getting weird, I need to do something. And I checked the tent by the inside and thank god, one of my newbie had left some embers from the fire, so I could see what happens between the fire and the zip of my tent. A minute passes by and the silhouette is there just between the fire and my tent. I stopped breathing. I literally froze. I started to move towards my phone when I saw the silhouette coming closer to the zip of the tent. I sent a message to one of my bosses who were always camping in the near areas if something happens. But I knew that she would take too long so I had to think of something. And to think fast. That's when I had an idea. I put my alarm on like a big siren, because sometimes we would do like night games and wake up in the middle of the night. So I put my bell on and my girls woke up. The silhouettes had started to unzip. I actually saw fingers from below. But as the silhouette heard my girls waking up, she or he sprinted back to where he came from. And that's when I saw two other silhouettes sprinting back in the same direction. Everything ended well. Twenty minutes later, my boss came and stayed the night, and I never had to deal with those silhouettes again, thankfully. Hey guys, I've recently discovered this thread and have decided to tell you about a creepy event that had happened to me not too long ago. So, before I start, let me tell you a little bit about myself and give you some backstory. I am a 15 year old straight male. I live in Germany, but I come from a small European country. This event had happened before my removal to Germany. In my country, we have field trips, usually at the end of 8th grade, that last for a week or so. Now, I've had my fair share of stalkers, but nothing like this. It was September in 2014, and I went to a field trip to an island with my class. I was 14 at the time. There was this girl Jane. Jane used to be a normal girl up until that point. She was always kind of shy and really kept to herself, but everybody liked her. She was never bullied or anything, just a normal shy girl. We used to chat on Facebook a little bit, but nothing serious. I never really harbored any feelings towards her neither in her favor nor against her. So, back to the field trip. I smoked a couple of cigarettes with our mates in our hotel room, and then we went outside. The teacher wanted to show us some plants that were specific to that area. Now, I noticed that Jane was talking to me more often than before, and that she had walked very near me, but I thought that was merely a coincidence. I didn't make a fuss about it. But as time went by, the things had started to get worse. She started touching me, hugging me, and following me, respectively. On the third day, we went on a cruise to a nearby island. 
and during the cruise, she was sitting next to me. She had a camera and was taking pictures of me. I've had a zero sense of restraint at that point since I was young, and I didn't think much of it. I've noticed that she was taking a suspicious amount of photos, mostly of me, and I told her to calm down. And then she talked to me for an hour, but she didn't say anything interesting. She was mimicking the Irish and British accents to me, and basically blabbering stuff for approximately an hour. I was just smiling and replying with, that's nice. In the following days, she started to hug me and made me feel uncomfortable. So one day, I came to her and told her that we needed to talk in private. We went to the woods and I asked her if she was in love with me. She denied and kept saying that there had to be a misunderstanding, but I knew that there was something off about her. And then she told me her life story. She said that her mother is a schizophrenic and that she's severely depressed about it. I felt sorry for her, but I still told her that the touching was inappropriate. During our conversation, my mates wondered where I was and organized a searching party for me. They found us eventually, but she had decided to stay behind and let me go. I have no idea what she was doing after I left. On one occasion, I'm a little fuzzy on the details, sorry. She came into our hotel room asking for water, as if there wasn't any water in her own room. However, when she got the requested water, she refused to leave the room. We got rid of her by telling her that we're going out to have some fun. The next day, the harassing got even worse. She would follow me around and hug me again. The peak of her abnormal behavior happened in the evening. I took a walk with a friend of mine and turned around briefly, only to see her behind us. She was following us, I kid you not. I've never felt this kind of dread in my whole life. We had made our way down the shore and hid behind a big rock next to a police station. We should go inside and tell the police that we have a stalker. My friend joked. Anyway, she couldn't find us and gave up finally. My best friend heard the story and went to her room to tell her to screw off. I was infuriated with him because it was rude of him, regardless of her actions. I'm usually not meek, but I thought that was horrible. Now I see that, no matter how cruel that was, it was the right thing to do. I went to her room and apologized for my friend's actions. She was in her bed, sobbing uncontrollably, and I calmed her down and went outside. A female friend of mine, Sarah, had invited me to come to her room so we could discuss something. I made my way to her room and saw two other girls there. We sat on the chairs in her balcony and she had told me that Jane is a very depressed person who has done some self-harming in the past. I was shocked when I heard that. So, amidst our conversation, I winced. I raised my look and saw Jane, maybe 50 meters, 165 feet away, just sitting on a rock, listening to music and staring at me. She had a solemn look in her eyes. I suddenly felt dismay and told my friends that we have a spectator. They winced to and we decided to pry on her a little bit before backing out of the bedroom. Just stay away from her, was the last thing Sarah told me before I left. And to my luck, it was the end of our field trip and I finally got some rest. Weird encounters with her became fewer and fewer because she was often absent from school. Later, I had found out that she had overdosed on sleeping pills a couple of times but survived all of them. There was even a rumor that she had ended up in a psychiatric institution. But I have no proof of that, so I can't tell you that correctly. Anyway, the point of this story is that sometimes you have to be rude so you can prevent something like this happening to you. It may seem cruel or might even hurt the other person. But in the end, it's your life and you have to stand up for yourself and make sure that you're happy. So, this happened back in 6th grade and I think it's the closest that I've ever come to dying. At the school I went to, we always used to have some big end-of-the-year field trip. We would usually go to some city and look at all the important or historic buildings, have lunch, learn some stuff, and then leave. That year, we were going to New York, and me and a couple of friends planned out what we wanted to do. We wanted to go do our own thing, go shopping, and get some new clothes, that kind of thing. Only when we got to the school the next day, the teachers made it really clear that we had to stick with the group. 
But since we were all stupid, rebellious sixth graders, we decided that we would just have to work around it. Now on the ride to New York, me, my friend Olivia, and my friend Devin decided that we were going to leave the group and do whatever we wanted. Our class was pretty big. Almost 60 of us because they put 5, 6, and 7 together. So we thought if we weren't gone too long, nobody would notice. We had brought money and we planned on buying tons of stuff. Because even though we were a big class, we lived in a small town with only a couple of stores. Olivia loved shopping and she had really researched the area that we were going to be around and picked out all of the good stores. She even made us a little map. She was good at that kind of stuff. Anyways, when we got to New York, Devin checked him out because his parents were pretty strict and he didn't want to get his phone taken away again. Olivia and I decided that he could just give us his money and we could buy the stuff for him. And so we did that. And after they herded everybody off the bus, we kind of lingered back. We were right about them being distracted by everyone else, because we got away no problem. Olivia's map worked out pretty good, and we were gone probably 10 or 20 minutes before stuff started getting scary. We had just left the store, and Olivia was carrying her shopping bags when this guy noticed us. It probably wasn't hard to pick us out. Two little 6th graders walking around alone, carrying a ton of clothing. He started calling out to us, saying how he could buy us more clothes, all the jewelry that we wanted, if we would just come with him. We didn't believe him of course, and we just kept walking, heading on to the next door. Only this guy wouldn't stop talking. He started following us now, and getting kind of upset that we wouldn't answer him. I told him to screw off because I thought that he would take a hint. There were tons of people around and we figured he couldn't really kidnap us in front of 200 people. But he kept following us, and he started getting a lot closer. He had probably been about 30 or 40 yards back when we could barely see him over the other people, but now he was only 15 or 20 feet. And that's when we started panicking because crap, there was this weirdo after us and we had no idea where the group was. We decided to split off from the sidewalk and head down into some alley, because we figured people would call out the guy if he started to follow us. But of course, it was New York and everybody else was wrapped up in their own little problems. So now, we're walking down this dark alley and this guy is still after us. He fell a little bit back, probably back to about 30 feet now, but now he's not pretending to be a good guy. He's talking about how he's going to kill us and how they'll never find our bodies and how much fun he's going to have with us. And he's smiling this deranged grin the whole time. We're both on the verge of tears now, because we figure this freaking psychopath is going to kill us. Olivia just decides to drop her stuff and yells, Run! And so we both start running. And we're probably about halfway through this alley. But then she turns around and she screams. So I turn around and I see this psychopath is running after us now too. And he has a knife. We're both screaming now, and I'm running faster than I ever had before. We just run out of this alley back into this crowd of people, and as we try to get into this group of people to make sure this guy can't stab us to death, I turn around and he's just standing back in the alley, smiling. And I turn back around and this random lady is asking what's wrong because we're both sobbing, and Olivia's dress is ripped and I'm bleeding because my arm scraped the wall, and we're crying so hard that we can't talk. As soon as we actually manage to talk, we tell her our school, and she looks it up and calls them and we somehow manage to find our group again. And we're both forced to stay right next to the teachers because they don't trust us anymore, and honestly I don't blame them. We didn't even tell them about the man though, and as soon as I got home, I'm grounded and my phone was taken away, but still, nobody but Olivia and I knows about that man. School ends a couple of days later and I get my phone back. So I text Olivia and she sends me a picture of our class in front of some important building and says, Look in the bottom left corner. And that man is in it. Mostly hidden behind some wall but you can still see his face smiling that deranged grin for the camera. We never really talked about the man again. I didn't want to bring it up and Olivia didn't either. I'm terrified of cities now though. I like to stick to a couple of towns near me and that's it. Those a lower chance of getting stabbed to death.
Okay, so basically, I was in high school and I had a friend who was four years my senior, referring to him as Ronaldo. Now, Ronaldo and I met during a school production and we got close. He treats me like a sister and I treat him like a brother. So, we hang out a couple of times in school and he would always smuggle me food from outside because he has senior privileges. Cue his creepy friend, AJ. So, AJ is Ronaldo's friend and they are the same age. I met him on a school trip and he was nice and all. I didn't know that many people and I hoped to be acquainted with my fellow schoolmates, some of which were older and some who were my age. So, I ended up engaging in small talk with him and trying to be as friendly as possible. It turns out that he and Ronaldo were friends, sort of. And that would mean that when Ronaldo and I hang out, he might tag along. Especially if we are in a group of other friends. All of them who are older than me. So you know, being polite, I would talk to him and make sure that he was a part of the conversation. I mean, he didn't feel left out with so many people around. I think about seven other people. He graduates and then I don't see him, but he added me on Facebook. Where he would message me on occasion and I didn't think anything of it. Until one day, he came back for an alumni event about three years later. I was at school late, supporting a friend who had a recital. As that was a formal event, I wore a dress and I put on some makeup. So there he is, catching me out of nowhere as I happened to walk by. And he said that it looked great and that we should hang out sometime. Which I didn't think was odd at the time. And I said maybe, and probably left because I knew the recital was starting soon. Now, this is the part that gets really creepy. He starts messaging me, asking me to hang out, but I tell him that I was busy. And out of nowhere, he said, By the way, you looked so sexy in that outfit I saw you in. And I was like, um, okay. Thank you, I guess. But I was a little put off, so I stopped talking to him. He then starts to send me lots of messages every other day to see if I was free. I kept telling him that I wasn't until he messaged me and asked me out on a date. The thing that irked me though was how he asked me. This is what he said. You know, I haven't stopped thinking about you since that field trip. You were so cute and so pretty, and the way we talked, I knew I felt something. Now that I have spent some time in college, I have to say that I've grown up into a man and have plucked up the courage to ask you to be my girlfriend. I can't stop thinking about you, especially in that dress. I'm coming back for the summer, so hopefully we can see each other and go out for drinks and maybe something more. I told him that though, I was flattered. I had no interest in seeing anyone and was focused on my studies, and I was busy doing student console and cheerleading. So he said that it was fine and that he would wait for me. The creep factor went up as he started to message me daily on Facebook, Skype, Instagram, and any other way that he could get to me, asking me if I had changed my mind. I kept telling him no, but he kept persisting. Eventually, these messages would turn into voice calls, which soon became video calls because he wanted to see that pretty face of mine. When I stopped responding to his advances, he started leaving me lewd messages about how he would treat me like a queen, and what kind of sex we would have and how attractive I was as an Asian, uh, compared to other Asians which is frankly quite racist. So I did what any other person would do in this situation. I blocked him from everything. That is after telling him no, I wasn't interested at least a billion times. Now, I thought it would all stop, but then he proceeds to make at least five other accounts on all social media platforms, and tries to friend me on Facebook, which I rejected, and follow me on Instagram, which is private, so I didn't accept, and message me on Skype. I had to block all five of his other accounts. His number is not inclusive of his original, and I started telling Ronaldo about my situation. Being the big bro that he is, he said that he'll make sure that AJ would leave me alone, which he did for a bit before I get an anonymous text saying I was a bitch and that I would regret staying no to him and that he would find me. I proceeded to block that number too and changed my settings to reject all calls and messages from unknown numbers. The last I heard, he was pestering some other friends in the group about me, but that got nowhere because Ronaldo was looking out for me and told everyone what was up. 
I am now on a different continent, pursuing higher education, and I swear to God, I hope I never see him again. In my graduation year in high school, my class went to a trip to a beach town. I was always a loner in school, and the only friend I had in school didn't go to this trip. I never interacted much with my classmates. At a point in this trip, we, about 21 people, were left in a famous seaside street filled with bars and restaurants. We were allowed to be free and have fun and eat and drink wherever we wanted. It was nighttime, and we could do as we pleased in that street until midnight. My classmates started grouping up and choosing places to eat and drink, and despair took over me as I hated grouping up. As always, I was alone and decided to wander around and find a place to have dinner by myself. Looking at the restaurants, I found a really cute one that served artisanal pasta, and it was empty. An old man was almost begging people to come take a look. I was such a good guy before this trip that I couldn't say no to not eating there. I made the old guy and the owner happy. As I ate my Italia Tali with octopus, the worst dish I ever had, a hobo sat at the floor by me and started chatting. I was eating outside. I was such a good guy that I thought, oh, I don't need to pretend that he's invisible. He's a person just like me, and I chatted with him. He asked if the food was good and chatty things like this. When the owner saw the hobo, he came right at him, yelling at him to leave. I was like, no, it's fine, we're just talking, and they gave up. The hobo said that he was hungry and if I could buy him food, and I said yes. I told him that he had a restaurant that he really liked and he would like food from there. I offered him money. He denied and said that he couldn't buy the food himself because the people there don't like him. So I said, sure, let me finish here and I'll go buy it for you. He waited patiently. After I was finished, he guided me to the said restaurant. We passed by the more populous part of the street where some of the others were, and a classmate that I should allow myself to call a friend now asked where I was going with the hobo. I said that I was going to buy him food and that it was okay. She didn't appear to accept it, but I proceeded following the hobo. It was getting farther away, the street was becoming darker, and it was with less restaurants. I told the hobo, Are you sure it's around here? There doesn't appear to be any more restaurants. And he assured me that it was just around the corner. Just as we exchanged these words, I hear someone screaming my name in the distance. It was that friend. Michael, what are you doing there? Come back here right now. She appeared really distressed. Still clueless, I thought she also needed my help or had something to tell me. I told the hobo that my friend was calling and that I needed to go over there. But we're almost there. I have to go and I ran to her. She said, Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? i had been asking around and that guy is a really dangerous criminal around here. Come right back with me. And I was saved that day by my friend for what could have been a horrible end to me, or worse. Back when I was in high school, my friends and I loved exploring creepy places. A few of us had a driver's license, so on weekend nights, we would gather a group of 6 to 10 people and go on an adventure. One summer, our favorite place to go was this abandoned movie theater on the west end of town. This place had closed down probably about three years before we started visiting it, and in that time it had become a rundown building. There were no trespassing signs on the front entrance and each of the fire exits around the building, coming from the theater rooms. The glass at the main entrance was all broken and had been boarded up. The front door was busted and it didn't latch or lock, so people were able to get inside. We knew that there had to be a homeless person crashing in there, but we were young and dumb and felt invincible in a group. It was part of what made it scary. We would always wait until between 11pm and 2am to go into places like this because we didn't want to have anyone see or hear us and report us to the police. We all explored it together the first two times that we went in. The screens and seats were all torn up inside each of the maybe eight rooms. 
The bathroom mirrors were broken, and there was graffiti everywhere. And we were fairly sure that there were people hiding in there while we were inside, even if we never saw anyone the first few times that we went. There were a couple of shopping carts from a nearby Fred Meyer inside, with cans and bottles in them and a few dirty blankets scattered around in different rooms. It looked lived in. After getting to know the layouts of the place the first couple of trips, we made a game of it for the third and final visit. This time, these six of us would split into three groups of two, and with our partner, the two of us would enter the front together and spend a full five minutes inside while the others waited outside at our chosen exit in the back of the building. The first two, Beck and Doug, both went in while we waited outside. About seven minutes went by and just as we were starting to worry that we should go in after them, they made it out the other side through the fire exit. Doug told us that they went upstairs into the office, and there was a sleeping bag that hadn't been there in the last visit. And as soon as they went up and saw it, they tried to leave immediately. But the guy turned around and tried to leave through the wrong exit, which was sealed shut. They were paranoid that they were being followed out, so they just stood there watching the way that they had entered the theater room for a minute, making sure that they didn't hear any noises, before they finally worked up the nerve to run out the correct exit in the room across the hallway. Doug and Beck both wanted us all to leave, but Jack and I weren't having any of that, and insisted on going in. Brad and Drew, the other group of two that was going to go at last, wanted to come with us. So the four of us went inside while Beck and Doug both waited by the exit. The first thing we all wanted to do when we got inside was go check out the upstairs office. Just as we started to make our way up the stairs, we all heard a loud banging sound. It was coming from the back of the theater. We all agreed that it had been Beck and Doug trying to scare us so that we would come out and we could leave. We got upstairs and the pounding stopped. Doug was right. There was a sleeping bag rolled out on the ground, with a few paper bags set up around it. Brad flashed a light in one of them and saw a syringe, and something that looked like a vibrator. We were all pretty grossed out and had a little laugh about it. We looked around up there and didn't really notice anything else interesting, and we were starting back down the stairs when the pounding started again. We decided that we should probably make our way to the exit. I hoped that we hadn't been caught trespassing by the police. We came out through the exit, and immediately, both Doug and Beck were talking over themselves to tell us that, about a minute after we had entered the theater, a really tall, creepy, homeless-looking man with greasy hair walked right past them, heading for the entrance. Beck said hello as he passed, and the guy stopped turned and kind of lunged a few inches towards him before stopping. One side of his face was really wrinkly. Beck thinks maybe he was a burn victim or something. The guy stared him down for a second and then, without saying anything, turned and walked around the corner where we had gone inside. They started pounding on the door right after he was out of sight to try and warn us that there is a scary dude in there with us. We were in there for about five minutes with this guy, and we never saw him. He had to have heard us and hid somewhere. We started to walk back to our car in the Fred Meyer parking lot, about a hundred yards away from the theater, and a car pulled into the parking lot and shined its headlights on us, before flashing its red and blues. The police officer had us all sit down in front of the spotlight in front of his car, and asked us what we were doing. We told him that we were going to head inside the movie theater, but a really scary tall guy walked in and we chickened out. He told us that it was really dangerous to go into a place like that, and that there had been violence in the building before, and it would have been a shame if we would have got hurt doing something stupid. He let us go and as we drove off, we saw him shining the light inside the front entrance. We took the nice police officer's advice and never went to places like this again. I never did find out what violence he was talking about, 
It could have just been a tactic to scare us out of coming back. We stuck to graveyards and cemeteries after this. Creepy dude that lives in condemned buildings. I'm glad I never actually met you. But thank you for getting me out of a ticket for trespassing. And thanks to everyone else hiding in the building for not assaulting myself or my friends. Back in high school, my friends and I would love to go to our local movie theater that was situated inside of our shopping mall. We usually would travel in big groups, but this time, it was only my friend Alex and I. We picked up a late night showing of some obscure movie. I can't recall the name because this happened years ago, and arrived on time to find our seats. Since the showing was late and the movie wasn't a box office hit, the theater was empty. We situated ourselves in the middle, where we could get a perfect view of the screen. Strangely enough, a couple that arrived late decided to sit in a row, with only two seats between us and them. My friend and I exchanged confused looks and then shrugged it off, figuring it was solely because we had prime viewing seats. As the theater got dark, things got a little weird. The woman of the pair kept looking over at us every few minutes. The first couple times I figured she was just a nervous person and was adjusting to her surroundings. Yet maybe an hour into the movie, she kept the pattern up. She wasn't even discreet with her staring, because she would turn her head completely towards us. I could see her entire face. I still see it in my head today. I nudged my friend and told him about the girl staring and he whispered that he had noticed too. At this point, I was feeling very anxious and almost wanted to leave the movie early. My friend didn't want to though, so I decided staying with him was safer than leaving alone. Plus, I was his ride home too, so I didn't really have a choice. Throughout the movie, the girl continued to look over. Every now and then, she would whisper something to her counterpart, but he himself never looked over. Once the movie ended, I grabbed my friend by the arm and told him that we should get going because it's late. He followed suit as I sprinted out of the theater. Once we were out, the halls were empty because of the fact that barely any films played towards the end of the night. I was about to say something to my friend about how the couple next to us freaked me out, but they ran out of the door seconds after us. I was freaking out on the inside but decided to try my best to keep my composure. My friend was definitely aware of them closely following us out of the theater, but he isn't the type to be confrontational. So, we just sped walked to my car. Once we got in the car, my intuition told me to just get out of the parking garage just as fast as I could. I saw the weird couple make it to their blue car which was on the same parking garage level to us. That wasn't surprising because the entrance to the mall is on that level, so everyone parks there. I sped out of the parking garage and drove towards the main street. I told him to keep a lookout and see if their blue car was following us. He looked back and said the coast was clear. I felt so relieved. Now, we were the only ones on the main highway because it was late at night and we live in a quiet, suburban area. And then, a few minutes later, a car came speeding up from behind and flashed their high beams at me. My heart started to race. My head just told me that it was them. I asked Alex if the car was blue, but he said that he couldn't tell. The light to turn left onto the next main street was green, so I took the left turn necessary to get to his neighborhood. The car backed off and turned on normal lights, but still, it turned left too. I caught a glimpse of the car and started yelling once I realized that it was the weird couple's blue car. Alex told me to gun it. So I slammed on the gas and sped down the last main street before I had to turn into his neighborhood. The blue car wasn't tailgating me, but was clearly following not too far behind. When the streets are empty, it's easy to follow someone since there aren't any other cars to dodge. I turned into my friend's neighborhood, 
but decided to drive past the street so that they wouldn't see where we were trying to go. The blue car followed us into the quiet neighborhood and was picking up speed to get closer to us. My friend Alex was panicking and asking what I was going to do. I just kept quiet as I sped too quickly down a random neighborhood street. I could see the car's lights behind me as I made a turn onto another street, but they were far enough so that they couldn't see me for about 30 seconds after I took the next turn. After I turned into another unfamiliar street, I turned my car off and flipped it into neutral gear. My car is a manual, so I am very familiar with driving it, and I knew that I had enough momentum to roll into an empty parking spot, even though my car was off. I slipped into the spot on the curb and pushed the brakes to get to a stop before the blue car could clear the turn to get into the street. I reclined my seat back completely and told Alex to lean all the way forward and not move. We sat there in the silent and dark car, my ears ringing from how quiet it was. My heartbeat was fluttering faster than it ever had before. I think it was a mix of fear and adrenaline. Within a few seconds, the blue car cleared the turn and started slowly driving down the street. It made its way past my car that was parked on the side of the street. And luckily for us, I drive a standard black Scion TC. There's nothing notable about the car. I haven't even changed the license plate frame. So, they must have figured that the cars parked on the road belonged to the people that lived in the neighborhood. Alex and I literally stayed in our hiding positions for 10 minutes, just in case the weird couple decided to drive by again. Luckily, they never did. Once we got up, we just stared at each other and didn't know what to say. We were both freaked out and had no idea of what the couple had planned to do if they had caught up to us. To this day, I still don't know what their intentions were. Maybe they're just a couple of deviants who enjoy freaking out young high school students. Or maybe they had even a more sinister plan for us. All I know is that I don't go to the theater late at night anymore, unless I'm with a big group of friends. For a little background, I am a shorter blonde female and at the time of this story, I was 15. I was a freshman in high school and had a friend named Gino that I was super close with. More of a brother to me than a friend. Gino was a junior at the time and a varsity football player so you can guess that he was in pretty good shape and could be intimidating if needed. Anyways, it was a Thursday and Gino asked if I wanted to get dinner that evening after school and then see a movie. I said yes and told him that I would see him at the theater around 6.30 so we could eat before the movie that started at 8pm. He obviously drove at that time but had to do some stuff after school, so I asked my mom to drop me off at the theater to meet him. Fast forward to 6.30, and my mom drops me off at the movie theater and leaves. Gino isn't there yet and I get a text from him saying that he was going to be a little bit late and wouldn't get there till around 6.50 or whatever. I didn't know where we were going to eat yet, so I just sat down on the bench and I waited for him. At the time, a brand new hamburger place had just opened up right by the theater. About two minutes into waiting and texting on my phone, I am interrupted by a man who was probably about 6'2", white, brown hair and in his mid-30s with a typical business-looking type. He said, Are you lost? I looked up at him, startled, and then obviously tell him that, no, I'm waiting for a friend to see a movie. He then proceeds to have small talk with me, and although I'm already a little creeped out, I talk back to him since it's summer. It was April, but I live in Arizona, and April here feels like summer. And being around 6.40ish now, it's still light outside. He then proceeds to tell me that he's the manager of the new hamburger place, and asked if I wanted a job. First off, the fact that he's asking a random girl if she wants a job is already strange, but I just turned him down saying, thanks, I already have a job. He then proceeds to start badgering me saying, come on, I can interview you right now, and probably pay you more. 
Just to see what he would say, I asked him, Okay, where would you interview me? At a table inside the restaurant? To which he answered, No, it's too busy in there. We could just go around back. Um, okay, I may have been a naive looking 15 year old girl at the time, but I'm not stupid. I told him again, Thanks for the opportunity, but no, hoping that he would leave. Nope. He now proceeded to tell me that he was actually in town with some friends and that he was staying in a nicer city in the state that I live in, and asked if I wanted to go to party with them tonight and I could stay the weekend. Um, what happened to being a manager at this burger place? Clearly by now, I know this guy is a creep so I told him that I was 15, and I couldn't go out partying because my mom would kill me. Maybe he just thought that I was older. Still, nope. He continued to press me on it saying just to tell my mom that I was staying with a friend and kept asking me to walk over to the parking lot where his friends were so he could introduce me. By this point, I'm standing up trying to think of ways to get out of the situation. And by the way, there's at least 10 people around since we're in public at a movie theater. But do you think one person noticed this 30 something year old guy creeping on a 15 year old? Of course not. At this point, I noticed the man was getting a little irritated. He was almost demanding that I just go with him to meet his friends. I wanted to get away from him, so I just said, sorry, I think my friend is here. And I started walking away when he grabbed my wrist. Not kidding, this creep literally grabbed me in public like no big deal. He started pulling me, all the while saying that I was going to meet his friends when, thank my stars, my friend Gino miraculously comes walking up. Gino asked what was going on and the man drops my wrist and in a rude voice goes, Who's this? So from being scared I said, My boyfriend, hoping that if he hadn't already Gino would get the clue that something wasn't right. The man gave me an evil glare and said, I thought you said you were waiting for a friend, not a boyfriend. At this point, Gino started pulling the tough guy act and started asking the guy what the heck he wanted and to get the heck out of here. The man, without arguing, just power walked away towards the back of the burger place, acting all upset. Gino wanted to chase after him, but at that point, I was shaken up and really just wanted to see our movie. Needless to say, I never saw the guy again, but to this day, I think about what he wanted. If I was naive enough to go with him, what would have really happened? I have no clue, but seriously, I'm lucky I wasn't stupid enough to find out.